Good morning uh, and welcome to the 8th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I can remind members to put their mobile phones in a mode that won't disturb our proceedings, please. Um, the only business on our agenda today is to take evidence as part of their scrutiny of the UK withdrawal from the U European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill, which was introduced last week. Uh, we'll be hearing from two panels of witnesses this morning. The first panel will consist of Michael Clancy, who's the Director of Law Reform Society, the Law Society of Scotland, uh, Dr Kirsty Hughes, the Director of the Scottish Centre for European Relations, Professor Lee McCarg, who is the University of Strathclyde, and Professor Alan Page, Professor of Public Law at the University of Dundee. Welcome all. Um, Professor McCarg, in your submission you state in your view that the, ball, the, the, the bill falls within competence of the, this Parliament. For the, for the official report, and I know you've given us some um, stuff in, in writing, but for the official report, uh, can you explain to the committee how you arrived at that view, please? Um, okay. Well, the, the the dispute as to competence as between the Lord Advocate um, on the one hand and the presiding officer on the other hand, and also we have, of course, the, the Welsh um, presiding officer taking the same views as the Lord Advocate. Um, as I see it, boils down to the question of whether or not it is competent for the Parliament to anticipate the possibility of deviating from EU law um, whilst the uh, constraint in Section 29.2D of the Scotland Act remains on the statute book. So in other words, the obligation um, to legislate compatibly with EU law. Um, the, the presiding officer takes the view that that is not competent on the basis that that would be to anticipate um, an expansion of competence, but the Lord Advocate and uh, the Welsh presiding officer take the view that because any effect of the bill is postponed until such times as we will no longer be bound to comply with EU law, then this is um, not exercising competence in advance, but rather taking necessary measures to, to ensure um, an orderly withdrawal from the EU. So um, the reason uh, I and my, and my submission was jointly with my colleague, Dr Chris McCorkendale, uh, took the view that the bill was in competence. Um, on that point about how you, you interpret the Scotland Act, um, we've, I think we recognise that there is a there is room for disagreement there on the point at which you, you, you make the judgment about whether a bill is within competence. Is the postponed effect relevant or not? And that really depends on how you approach interpretation. If you were to approach interpretation literally, then you might well say postponed effect does not save the bill. If you were to, to interpret it uh, the Scotland Act in the light of its context, in the light of its purpose, then I think there's a case for saying that the postponed effect does make a difference. The purpose, what is the purpose of the requirement that the, um, that the Parliament legislate compatibly with EU law? What is the context in which that provision was, was enacted? The context and the purpose is, of course, the context is one of continuing membership of the EU. The purpose is to ensure uh, that the Parliament does not breach the UK's obligations under EU law. Uh, so I think that on that point, um, the issue is arguable. Where I found, um, or where we found, uh, the kind of tipping point was in the Lord Advocate's argument that it is not actually contrary to EU law to make provision for withdrawal on the basis that um, the treaty's Article 50 provides a mechanism for withdrawing from, from the EU. It's a mechanism which anticipates a staged withdrawal. It's supposed to achieve an orderly withdrawal. And therefore, as part of that, making adjustments to domestic law to anticipate the day after you leave the EU um, would itself be be compatible with EU law. The Lord Advocate made the point in, uh, in the Parliament last week that if it is incompatible with EU law to anticipate leaving the EU, then the withdrawal bill itself would be contrary to EU law. Thank you for that. Does any other panel members wish to make a co contribution in this area? I can perhaps say something, um, okay. which is a, 
I find it difficult not to regard this issue, is the bill compatible with EU law or is it not? Not to view it as something of a red herring, um, something which people have been found it convenient to latch on to, but which doesn't really take us much further forward. My view from the outset has been that if the Parliament has the power to give effect to EU law with individual competence, which it undoubtedly does, then I can't see any possible objection to the Parliament providing when the UK leaves the EU for that law with individual competence to continue to have effect, uh, nor can I see any difficulty about the Scottish Minister taking power to adjust that law so that it continues to function properly once the UK is left with the EU. That, 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 that's the view which, which I took initially. But that, in my view, is the easy bit. <laughs> the difficult bit is when you start to try and work out, well, what is within devolved competence? What is reserved? And that's what the argument has been about from the very beginning in relation to this. Um, so I... You know, it's a nice argument, but I don't think it actually takes us much further forward in terms of the issue uh, between the two governments. OK. Anybody else want to say anything? If not, Ash Denham. Convener, um, some of the questions that I had have already been covered in some of the answers, but I'm just interested in this, this um, I suppose, the position between the difference in, of opinion between um, the presiding officer of the Welsh Assembly and the presiding officer here. Um, how do you think we've ended up in a position where two presiding officers of um, devolved um, legislations have, have come up with completely different views on this? Um, well, there are, of course, differences in the devolution settlements. There may be differences in the bill. We haven't seen the, or I haven't seen the Welsh bill yet. Um, although I don't think those are the reasons why they differ. I think the reasons why they differ is because when a minister or when a presiding officer makes a competent statement, they are not saying, I am absolutely 100% certain that this bill is within competence, or conversely, I'm absolutely 100% certain it is beyond competence. They're making a judgment. And, and in areas which, where there is genuine uncertainty, as there is on this temporal question, because it's not been addressed by the courts, we've had relatively few um, cases decided um, by the courts. So where there is no definitive answer, then there is obviously scope to take a different view, for, to, to, you know, to, to view the balance of arguments differently. And that's what, that, that's what a, a competence statement means. On the balance of arguments, I think this bill is within competence, or on the balance of, of arguments, I think it's beyond competence. So I think it's perfectly understandable that to different presiding officers um, might reach a different conclusion on the, uh, the varies of these bills. I remember too that I think it was Lord Hope who said rather dismissively at one point that this is just an opinion uh, by the presiding officer. The final decision rests with, at that time he was talking as a member of the UK Supreme Court. So it is an opinion uh, arrived at. Uh, in the relative presiding officer's professional judgment on the basis of the advice they received, but it's not definitive, it's not conclusive. OK, um, Adam, and I know Patrick's got a supplementary, but Adam, you want to? Thank you. I completely agree with what Professor Page said, which is that um, uh, the, the, the focus in both the presiding officer's statement and in the Lord Advocate's statement last week, narrowly on this question of EU competence, um, it is one important part of the question of the competence of this legislation, but it misses, I think, equally, perhaps even more important parts to do with the division between reserved and devolved. And I wanted to ask for your opinions, um, particularly the lawyers, um, uh, including Michael, um, for their opinions about, um, about, about this issue. So, for example, how, in your judgment, is it within the competence of this parliament to legislate for a different exit day from that which is provided for in the withdrawal bill? when it is clearly reserved to the UK Parliament to legislate for international relations, including relations with the European Union? Um, we've made it uh, quite clear in, in our submission uh, to the committee uh, that um, uh, this, uh, this is a, a bone of contention between the two bills. Um, uh, and uh, if, I, uh, if I can find my comment about that, um, it, it's... Um, 
in essence, because the EUWB, the, the withdrawal bill in the UK Parliament, has already been amended to identify the 29th of March 2019 at 11pm uh, as the exit day, uh, then uh, one might wonder why uh, the, uh, the legal, competent, uh, legal continuity bill, the LCB as I'm calling it, um, it has a, a provision which allows for Scottish ministers to uh, ordain uh, exit day uh, according to uh, uh, section 28 uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the bill. Um, I think that that uh, presents us with a, uh, a difficulty um, uh, because, uh, uh, for one thing, um, uh, in the EUWB, um, uh, UK ministers can change the 29th of March uh, as exit day. Um, that date is chosen because uh, it is two years after uh, the notification uh, uh, required under Article 50 uh, of the UK's intention to withdraw. Um, and uh, under Article 50, it is that date, uh, uh, upon that date, that the treaties cease to have effect subject to uh, any agreement which is made. Uh, and uh, so therefore, um, uh, there, there is a, a particular difficulty uh, if we're going to, uh, going to be thinking about a moving target there. And I don't say, say that there will be a moving target. But in any event, um, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a significant risk uh, of a lack of clarity if there is an ordained date uh, under the EUWB uh, and yet uh, under Section 28 Scottish Ministers were to ordain such other day uh, as uh, by regulations they might do on the assumption that this bill passes and gets the Royal Assent. Anybody else? Um, yes, please. I mean, I think you have to think about what function the term exit day is performing in this bill. I mean, it's not performing the function of saying when the UK ceases to be a member of the EU. It's not performing the function of saying when um, EU law ceases to apply. It's a provision for the operation of the continuity provisions in this bill, and it's a provision which, which governs the length of time for which the, uh, the ministerial powers um, apply. So it could have been called something else. Um, in which case, the, the um, you, you know the issue wouldn't have arisen about whether this relates to our relationship with the EU. Clearly, it can't because that would be out with competence. So you have to read you have to read these words in the context of their, the statute. What, what's their purpose? You also have to read this bill in the light of the competence constraints on the Parliament. And the courts are, are of course, directed to read the legislation as narrowly as possible um, to keep it within competence. Well, I was just going to add to that where conflicting interpretations are possible. <laughs> and if there's no conflicting interpretation possible, then Section 101 doesn't come into play. Um, I think the question is a good one. Would you like to offer an answer to it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm attracted by the answer, yes. <laughs> I agree. Um, I just wanted to make a general comment about the, the reserve de devolved and this, this um, what I would call a constitutional standoff, I think. Um, it's, it's clear that Brexit and the process of Brexit um, is in, in general disrupting, um, even undermining, I would say, our constitutional settlement. And I'm not only talking about the, the issue under discussion today. I mean, you know, there has been... Um, as there needs to be um, much discussion about the situation in Ireland and Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, and just as the devolution settlement was drawn up in the context of EU membership, likewise, so was the Good Friday Agreement. So, so I, I think we're in a, you know exceptional territory politically as well as legally. Um, and I also think, and I'm happy to talk about this more at some point if, if it's helpful, um, it's quite hard to conceive of any Brexit that doesn't put these constitutional challenges in front of us. I, th I think there may be. I think there may be one, but um, I don't think. Certainly not the path the UK government is currently on, um, and arguably not. 
the policies for Brexit of opposition parties, um, talking in the Westminster context, um, or other parties um, either. So I, so I think in terms of broader context, that, that's also worth saying at this point. Thank you, Camilla. Can I just uh, uh, give, give, uh, offer you one other example to, to chew over? Um, and that is um, uh, the, the provision in, I think, Section 6 of the Bill um, that uh, concerns the ongoing status in Scots law post-Brexit of the principle of the supremacy of EU law. Are you satisfied that that principle, that that provision, excuse me, is within legislative competence in terms of devolved, reserved? You said that's one to chew over, and I'm certainly happy to chew over. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't got much time for chewing, I'm afraid, yeah, Professor Page. Yeah. On to uh, the point about exit day, because uh, uh, Aileen is, is quite correct. Um, it, it is um, notionally a day at which um, uh, the, uh, the provisions of this bill would come effectively into effect, but we have a commencement provision for that. Um, and if one looks at the uh, explanatory notes relating to... Um, uh, exit day uh, at paragraph 119 on page 18. Um, uh, uh, se section 28 allows the Scottish ministers to appoint exit day, the day on which a number of provisions and powers in the bill will come into effect. The date appointed will be the day on which the UK ceases to be a member of the EU. Therefore, if, if uh, the EUWB date of 29th March holds... Uh, then uh, we already know what the date uh, of leaving is going to be, uh, and the bill should reflect that. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, that may be predicated uh, on a belief in the Scottish Government that the date of the 29th of March will not be the date of exit. And it, sorry, it, is worth, it is worth noting that that is what the explanatory notes say, but it's not actually what the bill provides in, in Section 28. Just, just for completeness, Clarks just had me a note from yesterday's DPLRC committee which the Minister said he would consider bringing forward an amendment to the Bill to match up with the UK exit day. So there's obviously a recognition there's an issue there. We're prepared to consider it. So just for the record, I don't know. Yeah, on you go. Sorry. Point about supremacy. Um, I, I think that is within devolved competence. We're, we're talking about um, affecting only matters that are within devolved competence. I assume your, um, your concern is about changing potentially changing the hierarchy of laws so that EU law would um, override previous um, UK legislation. But of course, the, this parliament can do anything it likes to previous UK legislation that falls within devolved areas. So that must include the ability to subject it to the supremacy of EU law. And you consider, Professor Bacarga, that this Parliament has that competence now. We're not talking about whether the Parliament would have that competence after exit day. We're talking about whether the Parliament has the competence now, because it's now that we're making this or being asked to make this law. I think that goes back to the, the point I started at, which is um, on that question of, of when these... Uh, uh, the temporal question of when, when competence takes, takes place is, is arguable. But if there is um, no potential inconsistency with EU law, then I think that temporal question is, becomes redundant. Uh, but as a general principle, I think, as, assuming at some point the Parliament can legislate on this matter, whether it's now or whether it's post-Brexit, of course that depends on what the withdrawal bill, how that is enacted, uh, but I think there would be no objection in principle to this Parliament providing that uh, EU law takes supremacy as regards legislation from whichever parliament enacted um, as of exit day. And so just one final supplementary on the basis of what you just said, which is fascinating. Um, what authority would you cite in favour of the proposition that the temporal point is redundant in those circumstances? It's redundant in the circumstances that there's no breach of EU yeah. law. <laughs> simply that. It's, it's, I wouldn't cite any authority. I would simply cite logic. If there's no breach of EU law, then Section 2092D doesn't doesn't bite. Okay, thanks. Now, Patrick, I hope not missed the moment for your supplementary. Because I, but, but. Thank you, convener. Good morning. It was just a, a very minor point following up on the, the questions that Ash Denham had raised in relation to the, uh, the, the different judgments that have been taken about competence between the Scottish and Welsh bills uh, and um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm aware that some people have reacted to, to the events of the last week or so uh, as though the, the, the opinions given by the presiding officer and by the Lord Advocate are somehow definitive rulings. I think you've very clearly said that there is space for disagreement uh, and that there are different approaches that can be taken to these questions. But just so that I was clear about what you were saying, is it fair to say that there is no single approach to these questions and to the balance of the arguments which could lead to the conclusion both that the Welsh Bill is competent there and that the Scottish Bill is not competent here? Is it these are fundamentally different approaches that give rise to these conclusions or to these judgments? Or is, is there any way of, of reaching both of those conclusions consistently? <laughs> I, I did look at the. I mean, I, I I find what has been said, both by the presiding officer and by the Lord Advocate, unsatisfactory. Uh, Professor McHarg and Dr. McCorkendale, in their uh, written submission, made the point that this moves the quality of debate in this institution on, in the sense that in the Parliament. MSPs, you uh, committees can talk about these issues, but I'm not sure you actually have anything with which to um, really <laughs> debate effectively this question of legislative competence. I only glanced at the, the Welsh presiding officer's uh, opinion, but I have to say I thought it was fuller, more comprehensive, uh, and more closely argued than what I saw from either the Lord Advocate or the presiding officer in this parliament. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I don't either. <laughs> so, to, to try and answer your question, I mean, it is potentially the case because that different conclusions could validly be reached and could be endorsed by the courts because you have two different devolution settlements, the terms of the... Uh, Government of Wales Act and the terms of the Scotland Act are different. They take a fundamentally different approach for the time being to the division of competence. Um, there may be differences of detail in the two bills which make a difference, um, but as far as the reasons that have been given by both sets of presiding officers are concerned, I don't think that is what their differing opinions turn on. I think I think their differences turn simply on a different approach to an issue that has not been definitively settled. Thank you. James. Thanks, um, bearing in mind we're in uncharted territory here <coughs> in the sense that we've got a difference of opinion from the, the Lord Advocate and the presiding officer, and it does put MSPs in a, a difficult position. Um, what does the panel think of the suggestion from the Law Society that, bearing in mind the, the uncharted waters we're in and the public interest around this, that both the presiding officer and the Lord Advocate uh, should publish their, their legal advice in full? I agree with that suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and on your, your reasoning for that. Well, of course, characteristically, um, uh, law officers don't give their advice, uh, uh, don't show their working, as it were. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, what one can say is that the, the presiding officer is supported by an extremely skilled and able team of lawyers um, uh, uh, in, in the solicitor to the Scottish Parliament's department, uh, and that uh, uh, he will have received um, uh, the, the best advice that they could provide. The Lord Advocate is also supported by uh, an extremely skilled and uh, well-qualified set of lawyers in uh, the Crown Office, and he too uh, will have um, uh, received uh, a, 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 the best advice which they can provide. So uh, one cannot... Uh, 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 the Law Society has taken the view not to, to comment on the competence issue uh, because that is ultimately a matter for the courts to decide, for the Supreme Court to decide if the bill passes and if it uh, uh, is referred there. Uh, so, um, uh, our, our view of asking uh, for both the, uh, the presiding officer and the Lord Advocate to explain their thinking uh, is, is uh, based on uh, the idea that there should be an element of transparency about this question. 
um, uh, and that uh, we should be able to see uh, the uh, rationale which led to the, uh, the two statements, uh, the one by uh, Mr. Swinney and the one by Mr. McIntosh. Um, uh, so uh, that's, that's our point of view. Now, I know that it is an extraordinary set of circumstances where law officers would do that, would provide uh, their advice, and I would expect the same to apply uh, to the presiding officer. But these are extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and I can think of only two examples in the past where law officers have disclosed the advice which they have provided. Um, the first was uh, by Lord Advocate Hardy, Lord, Lord Hardy, uh, in uh, connection with uh, the uh, mental health... Um, uh, or the, or the, hang on for a moment, as I recollect what it was actually called, um, it, the uh, Mental Health Public Safety and Appeals Act of 1999, uh, which was the, ve the very first bill published uh, and enacted by uh, this Parliament. So um, I think there, there is a, a point in uh, the official report where Lord Hardy uh, gives the background to his advice uh, on the bill uh, in the chamber. The other um, example which um, I, I can remember is Lord Goldsmith um, uh, gave a, 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 some idea of the advice which he had given uh, in connection with uh, the uh, Iraq War. Well, I, I said previously in, in answer to a question that I thought that the um, both the presiding officer's statement and the Lord Advocate's statement were incomplete, uh, and I'm sympathetic therefore to the suggestion that normally, if the presiding officer says this bill is out with competence. That is a very good reason for the Parliament simply declining to consider the bill any further. And that is what has happened with every private member's bill in respect of which a negative statement has been made to date. Now, that's not happening with this bill. The decision is uh, to go on and consider it, notwithstanding the presiding officer's advice. But I think it is uh, entirely within the legitimate expectations of members of this Parliament that they should have um, a full view of um, the basis on which the different views have been taken, which at the moment they don't have. James, anything else? Um, do any other panel members want to comment on that? No? Okay. Um, bearing in mind that we could get in a position where this, uh, this could be challenged, if passed, this could be challenged in the courts, what do you think that Parliament can do uh, during its process of consideration and scrutiny of the bill to minimise the, the risk of any uh, legal challenge? It will want to fully satisfy itself that the bill is within competence, and the only way in which it can do that is by interrogating um, the statements that have been made more fully than has hitherto been the case. Anybody else? OK. OK, James. Uh, Ivan, you're in supplementary. Yeah, uh, thanks. In Vienna, good morning, panel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just a, a, a short supplementary t to clarify for myself and others, perhaps, uh, about the, the point Adam Tompkins was making on the, the, the dates. Now, just to be clear, as, as far as I can see, the intent is clear in the continuity bill that the date, the exit date that's referred to in that bill is the same as the date that's referred to in the EU withdrawal bill. Um, and I'm assuming the way it's written is because there, there may or may not be a change to the date in the EU withdrawal bill, and however small that likelihood is, you need to provide for that so that the, the, the legislation is, is coherent. Um, and as, uh, if that is the case, then um, is it not just a technical drafting issue? That If there is a, a perceived issue there, and what would you, how would you propose that, that that be handled in terms of um, what would it have to say in the continuity bill to make sure that there wasn't the scope for making the argument that Adam Tompkins made that... Um, that the continuity bill was stepping outside of uh, devolved remit by perhaps suggesting that the Scottish Parliament had some say in when the exit date was. Um, I, think I, I think that's right, but I think it also illustrates one of the difficulties with uh, proceeding in this particular way of having complementary bills. How do you make sure uh, that they actually match up with one another? Um, you know, a bill passed by this Parliament, a bill passed by the Westminster Parliament. How do you, how do you do that? And the intention here clearly is to k 
cater for the possibility that the exit date as set in the EU withdrawal bill is changed and therefore this Parliament can then um, change the date in this particular bill. Assuming this isn't the first time that a piece of legislation is referred to something else in a different piece of legislation? Um, that's not quite what I was referring to. Okay. Uh, what I am referring to is the underlying strategy here, namely we will have complementary bills. Uh, we will have an EU withdrawal bill and we will have a Scottish continuity bill. Uh, and on the face of it, that's you know, a perfectly defensible idea. You know, why shouldn't you do that? One question you might like to ask is why, in that case, have there been so few of these bills? How many bills can you actually identify uh, which have been complementary bills? Uh, and one reason why there have been so few is because it's extraordinarily difficult uh, to get them to engage properly so that they produce the same result. Because you have two different legislators legislating um, and no guarantee that what comes out at the end of it will match up. Yeah, we've been in um, you uh, were uh, uh, back. Uh, uh, in, you were back in 2002. <laughs> be the case with. I mean, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm kind of treading carefully here. But would that not be the case with respect to EU law at the moment, where national legislators would would, would pass laws that referred to to EU law? Well, there's no problem with the EU. It's law. a question of sequencing. I think is the problem. I mean, if you're talking about implementation of EU law, you have a completed text. So you know what it is you're implementing. Right, so this shows that they're both... The trouble is yeah, they're both going through their parliamentary right. passages. So, so we know that, that this bill uh, closely mirrors the, the withdrawal bill in order to try and make sure it works. And that means that it's retained some elements of the withdrawal bill that have been criticised. Now, it's, it's perfectly possible that as the withdrawal bill continues to go through the Lords, those elements might be changed, in which case this bill ceases to be... Um, working in parallel, or alternatively, this parliament may make changes to the uh, to the legal continuity bill, which introduce um, new differences. So it's, it's because they're being done in parallel is the problem about trying to maintain yeah. okay. coherence. And um, in, in terms of, of section 28, you asked about, uh, is it just a technical thing? Well, of course, it would be a, a leave out such day as the Scottish ministers may by regulations appoint and insert 29th March 2019 at 11pm because that's what uh, uh, clause 14 uh, of the uh, of the uh, EUWB uh, says. Exit day means 29th March 2019 at 11pm. But even that bill makes provision for uh, the that to be changed uh, because uh, a minister of the crown, in terms of 14.4 may amend the definition of exit day in subsection 1 uh, to ensure uh, that the date and time in the, defini in the definition uh, are the day and time that the treaties are to cease to apply in the UK. And that's to take account of any further negotiations. To in the continuity bill? Well, you could do that. You could refer to... Uh, Clause, four, clause 14, which will become section 16 if the, if the EUWB pa Act passes. You could do that, but, it, but clearly the Scottish Government have taken the view that they want this to be a, 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 as a, much of a, a, a comprehensive bill as they can make it. Uh, and building on uh, Aileen's point about these two bills working in parallel, uh, it is absolutely the case uh, that, uh, uh, because I've been sitting through uh, the process in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, uh, that uh, there are a, a significant number of amendments which are being uh, uh, proposed by members uh, in the uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, uh, there are 80 groups of amendments still to go in a, a, a passage in the EUWB which uh, has allocated 10 working on 11 days in committee in the House of Lords and five at report. So that corresponds to 10 days at stage two uh, and five at stage three, uh, to give you an idea of what's envisaged here. Uh, and although uh, the Law Society may have proposed a significant number of the amendments in those groups, um, uh, the, the fact is that um, uh, members are free to do uh, to, to make amendments as they see, or to propose amendments as they see fit. But the government 
because Lord Keane has said it, is in listening mode, and therefore one expects that there will be amendments at report. And if there are no government amendments at report, I would expect that the members who are proposing those at the moment will seek to force those amendments onto the bill. So this is... It, it, one has got to be fleet of foot if uh, one is a Scottish minister here, because the EUWB could end up to be quite a different measure by the end of its process uh, from, what, uh, from what, how it appears at the moment. And it's not just the EUWB, because the trade bill, which is currently in the House of Commons, makes amendments to the EUWB. I could go on, but I wouldn't. <coughs> It sounds like one of the cynics of tying up the dates. There is a technical solution there that you talked through that would work. I'm oh, sorry, Ivan. Yeah, okay. It was supposed to be a supplementary, sorry. and it's yeah. gone a fair bit beyond that. So, and there are others who wanted to get into the competency, and we've moved into the detail area now, actually. Neil? Competency is covered. Sorry, it's gone. Apologies. Yeah, it's okay, look, we'll move into the, the sort of necessity area now. Willie? Convener, I just wonder if I could ask for a comment or two on the overall timing for this bill, for the Scottish Government bill. Clearly there's a view that, that there's an urgency attached to it and we need to do it now, and there's a, an alternative view that we don't need to be so urgent and perhaps we don't need it at all. Um, could you say, say something about what you think the advantages are or otherwise of bringing it forward now, and perhaps also what the risks are if we leave it till the last minute or in fact don't bring this bill forward at all? Can I take that? Um, so I think that the reasons for treating it as an, um, as an emergency bill are to ensure that it's enacted before the withdrawal bill is enacted. Um, there are two possible, two different reasons for that, depending on what happens with, with the withdrawal bill. So the, the, uh, the Scottish government's assumption, the Welsh government's assumption, is that if... Uh, the devolved legislatures don't grant consent to the withdrawal bill. Um, the provisions of that bill affecting devolved competence would be withdrawn, um, and then there would be a gap in relation to um, continuity provisions in devolved areas and in relation to ministerial powers to correct deficiencies. Now, if there's a gap, then um, the possibility arises of invoking the exception to the Sewell Convention, to the Legislative Consent Convention, which says consent is normally required. Now, we don't really know what normally means, but it's, it's reasonable to, to say that one situation in which it would be legitimate to dispense with consent is in circumstances of necessity. So, for example, the UK Parliament last November passed a budget bill for Northern Ireland because it was necessary um, that that legislation be enacted and the, the absence of an assembly in Northern Ireland um, meant that um, devolved consent couldn't be given. So if you get to the situation where uh, there is a possibility of um, a legal gap being left as regards devolved competence in Scotland and Wales, then there is the, the risk that the UK government could say, well, the absence of consent from, from the devolved parliaments um, has to be ignored. The alternative is if um, the bill, uh, the, the withdrawal bill goes ahead in its current form because um, that would place restrictions on devolved competence. It would do so uh, in a number of different ways, obviously in Clause 11, if that's enacted in its current form, that would prevent in the future this Parliament legislating um, in, in relation to retained EU law. Um, but also, um, as, uh, as the Minister pointed out yesterday in committee, um, Schedule 3 of the Withdrawal Bill amends Schedule 4 of the Scotland Act to add the Withdrawal Act, as it would be, to the list of enactments that are, are protected from amendment by this Parliament. So, uh, so this Parliament wouldn't be able to um, t go its own way at all on, on continuity because that would all be covered by um, all be covered by the withdrawal bill. So I think it, 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 the necessity is a tactical necessity. The necessity, the urgency is a tactical um, urgency. Other views? Thank you. Um, 
a, a couple of comments here. I mean, I, I think I think there is a general urgency both on on this issue and on the Brexit talks in general. And obviously, we're moving towards the target of an agreement by this autumn, the full withdrawal agreement, including a, an outline framework on the future relationship. Um, and, and perhaps it's, you know, it's pertinent to think of what the EU chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, said uh, recently in, in this, uh, as the Commission, in, European Commission introduced its draft withdrawal agreement text, that now is the time for text, not for more speeches. Um, and I think there is also, we haven't talked much yet, and I don't know if that's what you want to come on to in the detail section, but in terms of the common frameworks um, and whether there's consultation or agreement or how, how those common frameworks would, would run, which, which I think is um, highly problematic um, question. But if, you know, if you're going to establish common UK frameworks in some areas of agriculture and fisheries at the same time, as you are negotiating a new relationship with the EU in those areas, there, there's also a sequencing issue here. I mean, we're extremely late in the UK government coming to any position on that future relationship. Obviously, we're expecting the EU draft trade guidelines this, this morning or, or this lunchtime, I believe. Um, so, so we're in a quite extraordinary political and legal process of negotiation that isn't entirely consistent in terms of policy positions, therefore in terms of democratic accountability. Um, I'm not anticipating that the outcome of this process is that Scotland and the Scottish Parliament has a say in trade policy in the way that Wallonia does, for instance, but I think there are interactive questions here between the common frameworks um, and, and future uh, UK positions. Um, and, and so I think there's, there's a broader urgency, but that also speaks to the urgency of this bill. And w one other point, if, if I may, um, obviously the withdrawal uh, agreement will will be implemented if there is a, you know, we, we still could face no deal territory. If there's a deal, there will be the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill in the autumn. Um, and that may also then cut across some of both of these two uh, withdrawal bills, um, just, to, just to add to the complications we, we've all already been discussing. And of course, transition arrangements, assuming there are transition arrangements, will go into that withdrawal agreement, and that's not per se likely to impact on, on the actual exit date from leaving the EU, but, but again, it impacts on timing and sequencing as well. Michael, I think you'd wanted to make some uh, questions. A quick remark <coughs> about um, the, the need the need for proper scrutiny, and that there is a tension between emergency legislation, uh, which restricts time uh, and uh, the opportunity for scrutiny, uh, and that balance between uh, speed and scrutiny is something which uh, we think is uh, uh, can be problematic, because uh, at a pace of effectively three weeks um, uh, to put through this legislation, which by any stretch of the imagination uh, is a significant uh, bill. Um, uh, with uh, many um, many moving parts, uh, um, uh, which uh, all of which could uh, could cause difficulties in the future, we need to to be very careful about that. Now, I, I asked uh, my colleague Nicola Whiteford to uh, to look at uh, how many emergency bills have been passed by the Parliament since, since its inception, and eight bills have been passed, um, uh, and the sort of average time between introduction. Uh, uh, of these bills uh, and um, uh, uh, getting uh, uh, passed uh, is, for example, that very first bill I was talking about, it's about uh, four days, uh, uh, eight days, you know. Um, uh, so, but the point is that each of these emergency pieces uh, were effectively single issue bills. Uh, and, that, and that's why I think we've got to be, be cautious about uh, just applying an emergency procedure to such a significant measure. I appreciate that, Michael, but the Parliament's already decided that's what it Indeed. wants to do. Indeed, uh, yes. And, Will, and Willie's question was about more around about, in terms of the sequencing of other events elsewhere, was the, was the proposal of the continuable a reasonable one at this stage? Have I got that right, Willie? Yeah. yeah. Really about what the significance of doing it now, as opposed to waiting until around or near exit day, or, or perhaps even not at all. So what your views on doing that might be? 
it's about putting pressure on on the UK <laughs> on the UK government and saying that we're deadly serious about this particular issue, with a view to either having the EU withdrawal bill amended as the Scottish government would like to see, um, or alternatively, in the event that it's not having those provisions to which objection is taken, then excised from that bill, which would then leave you with your gap, which this bill would, in theory, at least fill. Um, but whether, <laughs> which, if any of these things is going to happen, you know, is impossible to predict at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Murdo. Uh, thank you. Uh, convener, um, given we're taking evidence from the Law Society, I should remind members of my interest that I am a member of the uh, Law Society, although not currently practising. Um, just got a couple of points around timing I just wanted to pick up, particularly from what Michael Clancy was saying a moment ago in his exchange with, with Ivan McKee on, 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 on the whole question of the interplay between this bill and the EUWB at Westminster. And clearly, the, the Scottish Government have said, in effect, they want to see this, well, this is going through the Majesty legislation, they want to see this on the statute book before the EWB uh, completes its parliamentary passage. But from what you were saying, Mr Clancy, is that not an inherent risk? Because the EWB is likely to be subject to significant change. Uh, and how can we complete this bill before us and make it truly complementary to the EWB if the EWB may be subject to further change? It may be subjected to further change. I mean, that's up to uh, the UK Parliament. And uh, amendments which pass in the Lords may, uh, through the process of ping-pong between the House of Lords and the House of Commons, um, uh, be rejected by the House of Commons and not make it to the final um, uh, bill which was put forward for royal assent. So um, uh, there is an inherent doubt in that. But uh, if you work through the, the sort of process which is currently going on, um, uh, there are six days left of committee, um, uh, five of report. Um, uh, that takes us effectively to uh, Easter, uh, after Easter. Um, and then uh, by the time you, we're done with ping pong, it's into May, maybe even June. Um, uh, so uh, there, there, and at each of these stages uh, in the future, there is possibility of amendment. So um, uh, there, is, there is a risk uh, that uh, the catch-up will not will, will will be the case that, that uh, there will have to be some um, uh, amendment to the uh, legal continuity bill as a result of what happens to the EUWB. That is a possibility. And taking the point that the Parliament has agreed that this should be emergency legislation, I wasn't trying to argue that it shouldn't be considered as emergency legislation. I was simply making the point that speed and scrutiny uh, are two things in tension, um, uh, convener. Um, and, uh, but when one thinks that um, uh, there might have to be some, some amendment uh, to uh, the LCB, uh, then uh, that that does create yet another uh, issue to be considered. Right, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, thanks. So, so just in terms of, of the impact of um, amendments to the withdrawal bill, I think you have to, you have to distinguish between two different kinds of scenarios. So that, that there's, there's a situation in which um, a lack of... Uh, symmetry between these two bills, of which there already is a lack of symmetry in some respects, that is a problem insofar as it causes complexity. Okay, but there might be a different scenario in which amendments to um, the withdrawal bill cause problems of, of effectiveness or workability. So those are the ones that are more problematic. If some change is made to the withdrawal bill which renders the approach taken in this bill simply unworkable, as opposed to amendments which increase the complexity arising from different approaches in devolved and reserved areas. Now, to my mind, that kind of that latter kind of complexity is a problem in itself. But in terms of the the bill, it's things that are done that make this simply not work that are more uh, more serious. Okay. So, just to pick up Professor McHarg on Mr Clancy's point, Mr Clancy's point was that 
the Scottish Parliament might complete the passage of the continuity bill, but with subsequent changes to the withdrawal bill at Westminster, we might have to revisit that legislation subsequently. Yes, and there are there are regulation making powers, aren't there? So. Um, um, I think there. Am I right in thinking there's equivalence to the to the powers in Section 17 of the Withdrawal Bill? Um, there are certainly some um, regulation-making powers. Uh, Section 34 well, and, and uh, Schedule 2 contains consequential, transitional, yeah. and and uh, transitory and other uh, saving provisions. Um, I, I think that that uh, that it would be possible. Uh, we would have to look at it a wee bit more closely, perhaps, to give a definitive opinion, but it would be possible to change uh, some aspects by uh, virtue of regulations. Um, uh, but as, as Aileen has pointed out, if the amendment to the EUWB is one which creates uh, a significant change, which causes a knock-on effect for the Legal Continuity Bill, uh, then uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that creates a, an enormous difficulty for the functioning of the measure. Um, and uh, there, there is also the, the uh, time issues which affect this bill, uh, because when it passes uh, from uh, this parliament, if it passes from this parliament, uh, then it, it would be uh, uh, sent uh, to, the, uh, to the law officers um, uh, to look at, and uh, they may uh, take uh, um, a different view about its future. Not, is, it, is not the inevitable conclusion of that argument, though, and, I, and I'm not just saying that some of this committee around elsewhere would be supporting it. That actually means given that the minister should take more powers for regulation to meet, to meet as a consequence of that potential situation, and that would leave less time for scrutiny. Well, um, yes, it would leave less time for scrutiny. Could be. But, that was, but, that, but that flexibility would allow ministers to sort things if, the, if there was a problem that emerged that was, as being described. Anyway, sorry, Murdo. Well, one more question on timing to Mr Clancy initially. Um, I, I read the Law Society submission last night. Clearly there's a large number of points in it and, and a large number of areas of concern that you've highlighted where you believe the bill requires amendment. Uh, you make a comment uh, in your in your uh, introduction um, where you say the Scottish Government should be permissive with suggestions to improve or clarify the bill as it passes through Parliament. So clearly it is it is your view that this is a bill that does require substantial amendment in order to fit, fit purpose and be good law. Respects. Um, we are therefore in a situation under emergency legislation where the deadline for lodging amendments is this Friday. Does that realistically give this Parliament enough time to create good law to ensure that uh, uh, this bill firstly gets the proper scrutiny it's required from all those who might be interested and secondly that there is sufficient time for amendments to be properly uh, drafted, lodged and considered? Um, I, I've, I've drafted some amendments um, uh, so, um, and I think that other people who will be thinking about amending the bill will have already been doing that uh, for some time uh, since introduction. Um, uh, so uh, I have every confidence uh, that the Parliament will rise to the occasion uh, and that the members will give the bill the proper scrutiny it requires uh, and if uh, it needs amendment that they will amend it. Neil. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're obviously discussing the necessity for the legislation, the principle of legislating here at stage one. The reason for legislating is that there is obviously no agreement on the EU withdrawal bill, um, but, the, but the Parliament and the public, um, it's been touched on earlier, don't know the areas of disagreement um, between the UK and the Scottish Government. There are reported to be 25 areas of disagreement. The Minister said yesterday at the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee that he couldn't publish these areas because he didn't have agreement from the UK government. Do you think that is an acceptable position, a sustainable position, and should we not know, or the Parliament, the public, not know, know now what the areas of disagreement are that are bringing forward this legislation? Yes, uh, it follows on from what has been said previously in relation to uh, the law officer, presiding officer's opinion. There is a massive uh, imbalance or asymmetry of knowledge surrounding this process an intergovernmental negotiation which has been conducted behind closed doors. There are various statements in the press which may or may not be well founded. Um, as an outsider, I've said before, it's impossible to know what's going on. 
I wonder to what extent uh, members of this parliament are any better informed about it. So yes, I would have thought, you know, we started with 111 um, EU uh, powers which intersected with the devolution settlement. You know, where have we got to in relation to that? What are the 25 outstanding ones? Which is what the argument is about. So yes, I mean, I think uh, it's not satisfactory, I think. Well, it suits the minister to say I can't because, you know, I need to get the agreement from the others. And, oh, yes, Friday is the date for amendments. Well, sadly, I couldn't get it to you in time. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's not doing, it's not, it's not good enough. I think, I mean, as, as a, a general point, um, <coughs> the intergovernmental negotiation of amendments to bills affects quite significantly the, um, the normal legislative process. I mean, if, if uh, amendments are agreed, uh, and therefore amendments are made to the to the withdrawal bill. I, I imagine that the UK government will be extremely resistant to any attempt to uh, to amend them uh, as the bill completes its parliamentary passage to the UK Parliament. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I agree that this is this is a not a desirable situation to be in. I would like to know more about what's going on, uh, but it is not surprising in the context of. Um, of intergovernmental negotiations. This is this is what happens. They they sideline parliaments um, and empower executives. We've been. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. No, no, no. After you. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I agree with what Alan Page said. I think transparency, you know, is highly desirable. It's democratic, and, and uh, in as various people have said this morning, in these quite extraordinary circumstances that Brexit are creating, um, I, I, I think, um, and in this particular constitutional standoff, I think certainly um, it's desirable. Um, and I'm, I'm not meaning to keep referencing um, the approach of Team Barnier, but obviously what they have done since since last summer has, has been an extraordinary degree of transparency in publishing negotiating documents and, and positions. And I think that has that has actually really been enormously helpful for both sides um, in, in understanding this extremely difficult and in my view damaging process. So so yes. And we have, from the very beginning, um, uh, advocated that this should be a whole of governance process, that it should include not only the UK and S Scottish and devolved administrations, the other devolved administrations, but civic society generally. Uh, uh, and, and I can only say that uh, Kirsty is absolutely correct. The TF50 website um, uh, uh, that the U EU Commission has set up um, uh, allows for uh, us to see all the documents in quick order although some of them are, are rather more uh, truculent than others. Um, if you ever look at an agenda of a meeting, it's not exactly a full agenda, um, uh, as we would understand it. But um, uh, it's, it's very important that there should be as much transparency as possible, and that uh, is unfortunately not the case at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Adam? Uh, thank you, Kavina. The question I wanted to ask about in this, in this section of our um, discussion, I think, has already been covered by Professor McCarg. It was a question about the um, extent to which all of this talk about exceptional circumstances, abnormal circumstances, um, uh, and so on and so forth, um, means that effect effectively the Sewell Convention no longer applies to the passage of the Withdrawal Bill, uh, because the Sewell Convention applies only in normal circumstances. But I think Professor McCarg's already covered it. Thank you. That's exactly what I said, Adam, <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> well, would you like to, in that case, would you like to clarify for the record? I say. So the, que so the, que the question is, to, to what extent do members of the panel think that the Sewell Convention continues to apply to the withdrawal bill, given that the minister said uh, last week in moving the motion that the continuity bill should be fast-tracked, that this is a novel situation, in normal times such a bill would follow a normal timetable, but these are not normal times, unquote. That's a quotation from the official record of the minister last week. And that seems to be, in my view, a concession by the SNP that the Sewell Convention no longer applies to the withdrawal bill. Okay, so it depends on how you understand normal. As you know, Adam, conventions are normative statements. They're not uh, descriptive statements. So descriptively, of course, we are in abnormal times, but that does not necessarily mean that as a normative statement of a rule, of a constitutional rule, that the normally exception to the Sewell Convention can be invoked. In my view, and I, this is... Um, there is very, very little discussion um, and very little experience of uh, what that normally exception means under the Sewell Convention. But in my view, 
um, it, it, it can be invoked either in circumstances of necessity, which may arise if um, there is a potential gap uh, and on the statute, in the statute book in relation to the continuity of EU law in devolved areas, but we're not there yet. Um, it may also, I think, be invoked in circumstances where a devolved legislature um, is uh, clearly attempting to abuse its powers. So um, in, in Harry Calvert's work on the Constitution of Northern Ireland, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, he talks about uh, the legitimacy of overriding uh, the, the predecessor of the Sewell Convention in circumstances where um, the Northern Irish Parliament was abusing its powers, and that was in the context of discriminating against, uh, against the Catholic minority. So I think you can make an argument for reading the normally exception in those two circumstances, but it's very important to say that normally is a normative statement and not a descriptive statement. So just because we're in unusual times does not necessarily by itself justify overriding devolved consent. I, I, I assume the convention continues to apply, if, if only because, at least my understanding is that the possibility has not been ruled out that this parliament will consent to the EU withdrawal bill. Uh, I don't think we've reached a, a definitive um, conclusion on that yet, or at least that is my understanding. Uh, so I, th I think it continues to apply for them all. Yeah. Okay. James. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I actually had a, a point on timing. Um, bearing in mind the, the Scottish Government's argument for treating this as emergency legislation is that it needs to be passed before the, the withdrawal bill at Westminster. Um, uh, and accepting that, I know there's some disagreements on that, but accepting that for the minute and noting that we've already agreed to uh, process the legislation as an emergency. But bearing in mind the, the points that have been made about the importance of scrutiny and also the fact, as Michael Clancy's described, the, the withdrawal bill at Westminster is. Uh, it's going to be at least May, June, June before that's completed. Is there not the case within the confines of tr still treating it as an emergency to at least extend it, uh, the timetable into April, to allow uh, more transparency, more scrutiny, and to give MSPs proper time to consider the, the significant issues at stake here? Something you need to bear in mind is is the, the four-week period between the, par the, the Parliament passing the bill, so after stage three and, and royal assent. So I, I can't comment in detail on how the parliamentary timetable works, but that, that four-week period has to, be, uh, has to be taken into account. But is that not the, that, that, that similar process as the case at Westminster? Because they would, they would need to... No, no. no. Once a, once a bill um, uh, has passed uh, both houses in uh, the UK Parliament, it, it then goes on for royal assent without the need for any four-week lying period uh, uh, where law officers check it uh, or uh, uh, may have a, a, a view on it. Um, uh, so therefore, that's, that's a, a significant distinction uh, between the way in which UK legislation works and Scottish legislation works. But bearing that in mind, um, can, uh, building on your earlier answer, mm -hmm. uh, can you give an indication as to what you think the timetable would be for the, the passing of the, the withdrawal bill at Westminster? Well, um, I, I think I'd indicated that 10 days for report, five, uh, 10 days for committee, we were already at, at uh, day, uh, day four, so six days left, um, uh, going on to um, uh, five days for report, so that takes us through uh, the, the Easter period and into uh, uh, well into April, uh, and then um, uh, in May um, there is a recess. Um, uh, so if, if things might have to be done uh, quickly in order to get, it, uh, but ping pong between the houses is the essential issue here, and that can be. Um, a, a, a long ping pong or a short ping pong, um, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the way that that works, um, uh, as we know, um, uh, uh, members of the House of Commons have said that they are uh, going to seek to make amendments to the bill, which may or may not 
be uh, agreed to by uh, the House of Lords. So um, uh, that could that could take a, a little while to get through. One could estimate that that uh, uh, the uh, the EUWP might be law uh, by uh, the end of June. Okay, thank you. Thanks, James. Um, Ivan, you still got questions in this area? Uh, yeah, just. Um, I mean, sorry, just just to, to clarify on on that point, you're saying it could be the end of June, but if things go smoothly, it could be a lot earlier. Um, yes. Right. Okay. 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 Yeah, I mean, the, the point I wanted to just to get your reflection on was the um, what we have heard in terms of the discussion between the Scottish government and the UK government. Is it coming down to to one word? Is it consent or consult? That's probably a very simplistic way of putting it, but that's um, that's a line that's got traction. Um, and that sounds very as if they're very close, but of course, in reality, and I just want to get your reflection on this. It's much more fundamental and substantial in that because that really comes down to the, the issue around about the devolution settlement and who has the authority to, to legislate in which particular sphere. So it might sound in the public realm, but we know that they're, they're coming closer together. But if that fault line remains, then would, would you agree that that means that fundamentally there's still quite, quite a difference between a distance between the, the two parties? There certainly is a difference between consent and consult, no question about that. But going back to what we said earlier about the complete lack of transparency surrounding this process, we know a what is it described as quotes on quotes, a considerable offer has been made by the UK government, which has been rejected by the Scottish government. We don't know what that offer is. Um, we haven't seen it, we haven't seen any form of words, so it's as we were saying earlier, it's it, it's very difficult to apart from recognising that there is still a fundamental disagreement to get any sense of where exactly the source of that disagreement or what exactly it is about, where, where, where indeed it lies. I think that's the difficulty. Sure, but there's, if, if that distinction remains and the parties haven't agreed on which of those two words to use, then that, that really is the fundamental issue. Well, the bottom line is that the, the Scottish Government insists and has insisted from, from the outset that any common framework uh, or those powers which are governed by common frameworks should be a matter for agreement between essentially the two governments or if you like between the two legislatures uh, that's the agree part of the part of part of part of your formula and that is clearly different from uh, this is what we're going to do we being the UK government and we'll consult you about it listen to what you have to say, but then we'll go ahead anyway. Uh, so that's a yes. Could I, could I just um, add briefly on that? Oh, it seems to me there is obviously a very big difference between consent and consult, um, but that if this, if this was opened up in a way that, as, as Professor Page says, it was actually possible to have a serious and substantive discussion of how common frameworks would work, how the decision-making process would work, um, then, then you know, it would be a, a more illuminating discussion and a, and a more democratic one. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be simply a standoff between saying, well, we're going to con consult as in existing JMC structures versus you're demanding a veto and we're not going to give it you. Um, but you'd have to look at in, in intermediate procedures, and and you know if, if you look, and I think Professor Michael Keating has made this this, this point in a, in a blog he wrote some time back. If you look at how the single market runs at EU level, obviously you've developed uh, complex procedures for how you agree common EU frameworks, including qualified majority voting. But that I mean that would be you know a completely new constitutional step for, for something like that to be established in the UK. I'm, I'm not particularly suggesting it. I'm just I'm just trying to show that there are, there are gradations here, but they're quite they would be quite complex and constitutionally challenging to set up. So so we're in in the realm, it seems, instead of, of, a, of a rapid and messy compromise, which which is, is, is largely going on or not or no compromise. Um, being being debated behind closed doors, and and so it's not only the distinction between those two words; it's it's the potential to consider what the arrangements could be that would would draw some gradated line between them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, I, I think 
I think Mike Russell said last week that the UK government is going to publish its text, amended text, next week. Uh, and it will be obviously easier to comment once we've seen that. But whether that happens remains to be seen. Okay. Um, we'll get into the detail now. Nobody else any other questions? Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, just before I ask my question, I think it is interesting that you bring up the point about agreement versus consultation. That's actually quite an important point, I think, that's been made. I'm interested in, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny in this continuity bill compared to the EU withdrawal bill. Um, does the continuity bill go further to allow parliamentary scrutiny of subordinate legislation as it moves forward? Is, do we have a better ability to then scrutinise if we have this continuity bill moving forward? The answer to that is yes. Um, there's, there's two ways in which uh, the scrutiny uh, provisions are better than they are for devolved issues under the withdrawal bill. Um, in the first place, um, the legal continuity bill provides for a super affirmative procedure for some uh, types of regulation. So that would require um, that regulations are laid in draft for 60 days rather than 40 days, uh, and that there's mandatory consultation both with the parliament and with other interested parties. So, so there's, a, there's a heightened scrutiny provision. Um, the other way in which uh, scrutiny is improved is uh, in that the um, explanatory statements requirements which were added to the withdrawal bill in the Commons, um, but which under the withdrawal bill only apply to UK ministers, are now applied in this bill to devolve ministers. So, so that's that's the, the two improvements in scrutiny provisions. There's also um, changes in terms of the, the scope of the powers. Um, they are subject to necessity test, um, uh, at least in part, mm -hmm. Um, and there are more substantive constraints um, uh, placing limits on, on how the, the provisions can be used. The only thing I would add to, add to that is to, to bear in mind that the EU withdrawal bill says nothing about the scrutiny that should be applied to the exercise of powers by the Scottish ministers. It leaves that question effectively to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I'm not aware that anything has been said about what the Scottish ministers propose in the event that they end up exercising powers under the EU withdrawal bill rather than this continuity bill. But one would expect what is being proposed in the continuity bill to apply to uh, the exercise of powers under the EU withdrawal bill, if that's the position in which we end up. In other words, this is the first sight we've had of the kinds of scrutiny that might be applied, regardless of which bill uh, the powers are being exercised under. To pick up on the point that uh, um, Aileen made about uh, the, um, the regulation making power, I mean, uh, uh, yes, it, it, it is improved in part, um, uh, but uh, if you look at uh, section 11 on page 7 of the bill, um, uh, where Scottish ministers were talking about dealing with deficiencies uh, in, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in EU in devolved EU law, that's when it is being transposed. There are deficiencies like um, mentioning EU agencies and things like that. Um, uh, ministers uh, have to consider if there is a failure um, uh, or a deficiency um, uh, and that it's necessary to make provision uh, and then they may, by regulations, make such provision as they consider appropriate for that purpose. And I think, you know, if, if it's necessary to make provision for the purpose of preventing it, uh, uh, then it, it has to be the case that, that they make such provision as is necessary for that purpose. I think that the, the, the issue of necessity has to flow through um, uh, to, to both of these aspects. And we talked about this the last time uh, when we were um, uh, looking at, uh, at the bill um, at the EUWB. Um, and of course, uh, the same point arises there um, both for ministers of the Crown uh, under uh, Clause 7 uh, and for Scottish ministers uh, under Schedule 2. Uh, so it's, it's still um, uh, an issue to be picked up on. I would disagree with that. Um, yes, it could be necessary to make changes. 
question number one. We're agreed on that. Well, what changes are appropriate? Uh, I mean, I, can, I, I think it would be perfectly possible to separate these two things. I can take the point, but uh, it is also a discretion for Scottish ministers to make these necessary arrangements. And I think that that might be uh, something to be looked at too. Okay, we're not in a debate here, so we'll move on. Um, am I anything else? trying to be clear that the continuity bill actually has an advantage in it. It will allow further scrutiny of secondary legislation, whereas the EU withdrawal bill doesn't have that. Uh, yes, but it also creates additional delegated powers. So there's a, an entirely new delegated power in relation to um, keeping pace with mm. post uh, post-exit developments in EU law. So that's something to, to, to bear in mind. The, 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 the powers that have been taken across from the withdrawal bill are narrower, but then um, balanced by this entirely new power. The criticism of the EU withdrawal bill is that it involves a massive arrogation of powers by ministers at the expense of Parliament to make laws, which is justified by the... Um, scale of the challenge which is being faced, exactly the same criticism can be made of the continuity bill in relation to the powers which are being taken by the Scottish ministers to deal with the challenge here. Okay. Okay, I, I need to, I'll come, come to you in a minute, Patrick, but I need to, Alexander's not been in yet at all, so I need to make sure he gets an opportunity to ask his question. Uh, a, a very brief question, a question on cost and probably more one for the Minister. Uh, does the panel have any views on the cost of this legislation and whether there's precedent for a bill to be passed in the absence of such detail? <laughs> no precedent of no view. <laughs> Dr. Hughes? No. Uh, no, I don't have a view either. So. Brief question. Yeah. Um, thank you very <coughs> much. I wanted to ask some uh, some questions as well on scrutiny of the, the powers that are created under the the bill. And um, we can make a comparison with the, the EU withdrawal bill. We can also judge this bill on its own terms and ask if we can improve uh, what's what's proposed there. Um, would it be reasonable to suggest that as well as specifying particular types of regulations that ought to be subject to the affirmative rather than the negative procedure, or the super affirmative rather than the affirmative procedure, that there ought to be some kind of sifting mechanism for Parliament uh, to require minister, Scottish ministers to publish a draft of, a, of an instrument, and for Parliament then to decide if a, if a measure needs to be bumped up from negative to affirmative, or affirmative to super affirmative? Yes. 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 Uh, would, would that be, in your view, best done by a specific sifting committee or a job given to subject committees of Parliament? Would that be any different than simply lodging a motion to annul a negative instrument and, and therefore requiring some, some greater uh, discussion around the, the instrument? I think one of the crucial things here, and there was reference to it yesterday, is um, the scale and the timing of the subordinate lawmaking programme, so you know what is actually being talked about roughly when, and you can either have possibility number one, a committee whose job it is to look at that programme and say that these are the instruments that you know deserve a heightened degree of scrutiny, possibly in consultation with subject, subject committees, or you can leave that task to, to subject committees, but I would have thought a dedicated committee would be the right way to go about it. Yeah. That would probably be the, the best way to do it. Uh, it would be focused on uh, the instruments in, in before them. Um, I think um, uh, and they are of a different character from the kind of ordinary instruments which, which people might, might come across in, in other contexts. Um, I, I think uh, the important issue is, is something which we've been talking about since the very beginning of this process, which is uh, proper consultation on these draft orders. Time is getting very short now, um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think waiting until either the EUWB, um, so this is addressed to UK ministers, um, to wait for it to become law before starting consultation on draft orders uh, is, I think, a, a waste of time, uh, that we, uh, because uh, departments are doing this, uh, and the same uh, are, are drawing up draft orders and and looking at them even as we speak. Um, uh, and I think that that would be something which I would address also to Scottish ministers, to Scottish ministers, so that there would be a proper consultation on these draft orders as soon as possible. 
regardless of what happens with this bill or the EU withdrawal bill? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Could I just make a, an additional point there, um, which I think follows on, with, both with the EU withdrawal bill and, and with the continuity bill, which, which is, as a number of also the Westminster Select Committees have have said, just simply transposing EU law in, in many cases, not least in the environmental area, um, doesn't doesn't work very well unless you have the appropriate regulatory structures as well and, and, and the appropriate regulatory agencies and there's also clearly major timing questions in establishing those and deciding how how they will function um, and, and the transition period if there's a transition period uh, if there's if there's a deal there presumably there will be a transition period um, is is as currently debated in terms of December 2020 clearly very short a couple of other points on on scrutiny um, in section 31 uh, the power is, is created to uh, introduce uh, regulations under uh, urgent cases um, without prior approval by Parliament and, and subsequently uh, laying a, a, an instrument before Parliament and, uh, and Parliament being required to, to pass a resolution. Uh, is that adequate or is there a case for... Uh, perhaps giving Parliament an emergency break on that that power, uh, suspending that power if we feel it's been misused, or perhaps um, requiring a, a time limit between uh, the uh, making of an order and the laying of it before Parliament, which I don't think is included at the moment. We, we criticised the analogous provision uh, in the EUWB um, it, it, because it, it, it gives ministers uh, a, a significant amount of power. And uh, I think what would be useful would be to discover what is actually considered to be an urgent case. Um, a, a, and, and, and I think that that's, that's something a, a ministers consider that by reason of urgency it's necessary to make the regulations without being subject to... Uh, the affirmative procedure is uh, the provision in 31.2. So what, is, what are the parameters of this urgency? That might be one convener, uh, very perceptive of you, um, uh, and uh, you might uh, suggest that as an amendment to the... Uh, but once we start describing urgency, of course, uh, then it becomes what's not included in the list. Yeah. Another area is Section 17, uh, which um, gives Scottish ministers the ability uh, to consent to regulations made by the UK government. Uh, should that consent power lie with Scottish ministers or with the Scottish Parliament? Well, I, I've already said in my written submission yeah. that I think this, this power is open to objection or this attempt to fetter the the power of UK ministers, the powers granted by the EU withdrawal bill, uh, is open to objection. Um, you need only imagine the converse situation in which, um, let's say, uh, an amendment is passed to the EU withdrawal bill which says that all the powers which it is proposed to be conferred on Scottish ministers under the Legal Continuity Scotland Bill should be subject to uh, the agreement of UK ministers. How would this Parliament react to that? I don't think this is a... I think those powers should be subject to um, the consent of the Scottish ministers. And in some cases, yes, possibly this parliament as well. But I think the way in which to achieve that, as I said, is by amendment to the EU withdrawal bill rather than by trying to, to use this vehicle. If this bill is passed by the Scottish parliament, if the continuity bill is passed by the Scottish parliament, uh, and it includes some provision for the consenting of UK-made regulations which touch on devolved areas. Is there, a, is there a reason why that consent should be given by ministers alone without the consent of the Scottish Parliament? From case to case. You, know, you could imagine cases in which you would want parliamentary consent as opposed to just ministerial consent. Yeah, I don't see why not. I can't think of anywhere ministerial consent alone would be enough. <laughs> okay. Can you? Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I, 
Okay. Um, I'm not going to object to heightened scrutiny, scrutiny at all. No. Okay. Uh, unless anybody else wanted to come in on that, um, I had some questions on. EU principles, but do you do you want Look, other people Neil, to come in I on think scrutiny? Neil first? originally had a question on detail. You stop, is it, has it been used, Neil? Or it? It's on secondary legislation, section thirteen. Do you want to do that first, and I'll come back. To okay, questions. thanks, Kevina. Um, just on section thirteen, the power to use secondary legislation to incorporate new EU law, which we've we've touched on. Um, Pro Professor Page, you said in your written evidence that. Um, uh, the, power, the ministers taking these powers would be a potentially major surrender by the Parliament of its legislative competence, uh, uh, and one which, under the bill, was introduced may be extended indefinitely. I, would, I was concerned by, by, by the phrase "major uh, surrender" by the Parliament. Um, that concerned me greatly. Can you explain further about what you meant by that? Well, uh, it would simply be leaving to ministers uh, the discretion to decide which. Um, EU instruments uh, to give effect within within Scotland, and at this point, uh, Scotland, the UK, will no longer be a member of, of the European Union. Um, and uh, I, I, I would be frankly astonished if, if we were to be, as I said, and I chose the word deliberately, surrendering the competence of this of this Parliament to not just uh, Scottish ministers, but to institutions in whose deliberations. We have absolutely no voice. Uh, I mean, I think that if we're going to do that, then that should be a, a properly discussed, argued, and decided uh, matter. So that, that, that's yeah. my objection to it, Thank or my surprise yeah. that this provision is in the bill. Thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, I mean, it's been mentioned earlier that um, the government said there are similarities between the continuity bill and the EU withdrawal bill, and that, and that may concern people concerned about parliamentary scrutiny and, and legal. Uh, certainty. Can I ask also the, the other witnesses for their views on the appropriateness of this uh, of this power, um, and also could it, could this section of the bill be interpreted as a power grab by Scottish uh, ministers, and specifically, the, um, why should the power be extended after five years, as is made out in section thirty? Yeah. I mean, the 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 obvious analogy to draw with this power would be section two two of the European Communities Act, which gives ministers power to implement um, uh, EU obligations by secondary legislation. But as, uh, as Alan said, that is much harder to justify in the circumstances where we are not members of the EU. But um, so, so if this is simply um, a way of allowing ministers to uh, more easily implement changes which they think are desirable then i think i think it's quite hard to justify but you but if we do get into a situation whereby we actually have to as a consequence of whatever deal we negotiate for withdrawal we have to keep pace with um, developments in eu law in certain areas then some kind of keeping pace power then um, is much more is much more justifiable so i think I, I, as with m much of this stuff, it, it really depends on what the post-Brexit constitutional landscape and post-Brexit relationship with the EU lo looks like. That will affect the justifiability of this power. I mean, I think I think on that, it's it, it's it's a rather bizarre situation, as you you know, following on from from what Professor McCarg has, has just said. I mean, if you think of something like the European Economic area, which, you know, in Norway has been called a fax democracy in its own review of the operating of the European economic area, it has said there's a major democratic deficit. I mean, this power, um, uh, as Professor Page has said, we, we, you know, at least in the EEA, you have some ability to comment on e EU law, but it, it, it's, it's really a rather minor, <coughs> excuse me, compared to being um, an EU member state. On, on the other hand, obviously, in this case, you're not obliged, because you're not uh, depending on, on what any final Brexit deal says, but you're not obliged to, to implement that law. So you, I suppose it's optional. You can pick and choose. But uh, again, why the Scottish government rather than the Scottish parliament would, would decide that is, is one question. Um, and, I, and I also think, I mean, at, at the moment, as, as I said um, near the start of this session, at the moment, we're heading to a... a uh, a free trade agreement. We're heading to some sort of perhaps Canada-style deal. Um, what happens if Westminster votes, for instance, for a comprehensive 
customs union uh, with the EU? Would that cover agriculture and fisheries, um, for instance? Um, what if you added the single market into that? Then you transform the context of this, of this particular debate. Um, so, so yes, I, I, I think at, at best it's rather curious, and at, and at worst it's, it's a strange power to give to the Scottish Government, not, not at least the Parliament. No, if in, in these circumstances for that were to arise, it might be unusual, but if it were to arise, that if the Government were to say that it has to come to an agreement with the Parliament and what, what, what legislative process would be used in such circumstances, and then it would have to agree with Parliament, whether it was secondary or primary legislation, etc., if there was going to be that sort of change. But the provision allows for Scottish ministers, by regulations, to make... Uh, I'm suggesting if that was amended, would that... If it were amended. Um, if it were amended, and were, I mean, I, I would advance uh, in, in response to Mr Harvey and also to Mr Bibby that the Parliament has to have the central role here. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and that if, if uh, Scottish ministers in the future, once the UK has left uh, the, uh, uh, the EU, wish to adopt provisions in EU regulations uh, and, and uh, uh, other aspects of EU law, then the appropriate way to do that would be to... Uh, uh, regard, have regard to um, the EU legislation and then bring forward Scottish legislation uh, which matches that in, 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 in whatever respect, provided it's within devolved competence. And that, that uh, could be done today, let's say, with the succession regulation which we're not opted into as the UK. We could uh, create a law in Scotland which looked like the succession regulation. Um, so I think that, that that would be where, where I would, would park this. Alan, you want to say more? No? Oh, yeah, I think it's okay. a consensus. Yeah, it's a thoroughly bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, now, I think that takes us to Patrick, who's a slightly different area, Patrick. To, and I think this is the final question, if I've got that right, unless there's any supplementaries. Um, thank you. Section 5. Um, so it's at uh, the, the start of Section 5. The general principles of EU law and the Charter of Fundamental Rights are part of Scots law. On or after exit day, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, this is one of the areas of difference between the continuity bill and the the EU withdrawal bill, and we've seen significant debate at Westminster about to what extent that's uh, the, the EU withdrawal bill is acceptable and should, uh, in particular, some of the environmental principles of EU law be specified and set out uh, in relation to things like. The polluted pays principle, precautionary principle, issues around animal welfare and sentience and so on. Um, is the approach in this bill um, clear and adequate uh, in, in simply saying the general principles and the charter apply, or does it need to, or, or is there a case for it going into more detail about what those principles are and how they should apply? I think the starting point is to point out that probably the more important difference between the two uh, bills is not necessarily the direct incorporation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, because there is the argument that the rights contained in the Charter, so far as they're justiciable, are incorporated by the, the, um, by the withdrawal bill anyway. Um, it's, it's a question of accessibility really, rather than substance, at least arguably. But where there is a, a very important difference is in, in relation to Section 5.2, which for Scotland, for, which for devolved matters, would retain a right of action based on failure to comply with the general principles and the, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. That is missing from the, uh, from the withdrawal bill. And to my mind, that's, that's the much more significant issue. Because unless there is a right to bring actions based on charter rights, it, you know, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference whether or not it's incorporated. So I think that's, that's the important difference. Uh, in, in relation to um, the, the principles uh, of EU law, um, Section 5.3 uh, says that uh, the, the first part of, of Section 5 applies in relation to the general principles of EU law only if it was recognised as a general principle of EU law by the European Court in a case decided before exit day. 
is it the case that there are some things regarded uh, so widely regarded as general principles of EU law that they've never been brought in a case? Uh, do we need to specify what we mean by these principles, or can we rely on, on that definition uh, to have full effect? Subsidiarity? Well, in response to your initial question, I, I was sympathetic to the idea that one, there is a case for elaborating, explaining this is what we mean by general principles. As regards your the question that you just asked, I think it's highly unlikely that there are general principles out there which have not been uh, recognised uh, in judgments of the, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. We, we said in our submission that it, we believed it would be helpful if the government were to set out what general principles uh, are to be retained in uh, Scots law and, and the fundamental principles, we enumerated them, uh, proportionality, subsidiarity, etc. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, but I agree with, with uh, Alan that uh, it's unlikely that there's a general principle which uh, we're not aware of at the moment. But your question went further because you then started talking about principles of environmental law and so on, which um, would need to be separately provided for because they wouldn't be, I don't think, be covered by the idea of just general principles of EU law. Okay. And, and just finally on, on this, that there's, a, there's a flip side to the argument. Uh, uh, Michael Clancy just mentioned uh, subsidiarity. Now, I think even though subsidiarity... Uh, you, you, you might say it's, it's never been as uh, applied as rigorously or as clearly as, as uh, it was intended to be. Um, I would still regard it as a loss, personally, if, if, we, if we didn't have that, that principle uh, recognised at some level. But does it make any sense for it to be recognised in Scotland but not at UK level? Uh, do, does subsidiarity mean anything if it isn't applying throughout the UK? Only if, how, could, how could subsidiarity only apply at one level of government? We have more than one level of government in Scotland. Mm -hmm. we, Just so about. It, <laughs> so it, it could be used, it could be invoked by local authorities to protect their spheres of competence. I, I don't know if it has been used in that way at EU level. I mean, the subsidiarity principle is about the relationship between EU law and, and, and member states. But as a principle, of course, the principle is that decisions should be taken at the lowest level um, appropriate. So it, as a principle, it's, it's uh, potentially more broadly applicable. But I think that would probably require some um, uh, creativity on the parts of our, the part of our courts post-Brexit. OK. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. That concludes this particular session. It's been a very good session, covered a lot of ground. I'm very grateful for you coming along. I know a lot of this has been at short notice. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. I think we should probably suspend for about 10 minutes uh, and then begin again with the Minister in 10 minutes. So I tell her to change over her witnesses and I will suspend this meeting.
Um, colleagues, we begin again. Um, we're joined for our second evidence session on the UK withdrawal from the European Legal Continuity Scotland Bill by Mike Russell, the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's place in Europe. And Mr Russell will be supported today by a range of officials, Alison Cool, Graham Fisher, uh, Luke McBratney and Jenny Bruff. I'm not let out what, what you all do because I'm trying to cut some time down here. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Mr Russell to make an opening statement. I really haven't a, a statement to make. I, I think everybody knows my position on this bill by now. Um, I'm quite happy to uh, comment and to respond to any questions that you have. OK, we're, we're going to cover three sort of main areas, uh, areas around competence, necessity and detail on the bill. Um, can, I, so, uh, can I begin by asking the, uh, uh, the Minister a question on the competence issue? Can you explain, Minister, why in the light of the presiding officer's statement on legislative competence, it remains the Scottish Government's view that the bill is within competence? Yes, uh, we can go into, and, and I'll invite my colleagues to go into some of the legal detail if you wish, but I, I thought that the previous panel, and I watched it with great interest, expressed the, the issues very well. Um, there is a genuine difference of opinion, and it's done with respect, between the presiding officer, who has one view, uh, the Lord Advocate, who has indicated what the government's view is, and that is the Lord Advocate's function, and he's entitled to do that under the ministerial code, and then a range of other views. The Welsh presiding officer has a view on, on their bill, and, and I heard uh, the panel give uh, differing views. But the, um, those who framed the original Scotland Act anticipated this, this circumstance. It is, uh, it, is, it is unique, but it is not unanticipated. That there could be a time in which there was a difference of opinion between a, a government and um, the presiding officer. And indeed, there has been academic study of this. Uh, uh, 2017, McCorkendale and, and Hybert looked at some of the issues um, in a very interesting paper in the Scottish Law Review. Um, so, in the circumstances in which there is a disagreement, and there is a disagreement here, the government is, is permitted and entitled to bring the bill in, and that is what it has done. The debate will no doubt continue. I, unsurprisingly, side entirely with the advice that I've had from the government has had from the Lord Advocate. Um, I think that some of that was well explained by others today. Uh, Professor Tomkins has taken a different view and, 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 uh, and is supporting the view of the presiding officer. Um, we then move forward on that issue. In terms of the central issue of, of uh, a, the, um, uh, a, a, the compatibility uh, with EU law and the necessity that, they, they, that, they, that they, is laid upon us, I think it is in a logical sense, and I was very struck by this by Alison McHarg's appeal to common sense, it is, a, in a logical sense, very difficult to understand how we could not legislate in this way on the up, and up to and including you know, the, the afternoon of 29th of March 2019. Uh, that would be an unreasonable position to be in, but that is the inference of, of where um, those against uh, this particular competence put themselves. But it is a genuine debate. And that debate will continue. And uh, you know, we will obviously have to have it between lawyers and between experts and then between laymen like myself and, and others. Yeah. Ash Daniel. Um, obviously, this morning we were speaking a little bit about this incompatibility argument. So that's the one advanced by the Lord Advocate last week, where he said that if the Scottish continuity bill is incompatible with EU law because it contemplates this post-Brexit scenario, um, and departure from EU law, then the same argument would equally apply to the UK's withdrawal bill. But then if you watched the session earlier, you were seeing Professor Page, or he said what he thought it actually hinged on um, was, does the Scottish Parliament have the power to enact the legislation? And if it does, it's within competence. What would be your view on those two? I believe it does have the power to enact legislation. That's it's where I stand. But I, I know Professor McHarg also drew attention to another point that the Lord Advocate made, which I think is very telling. The, you know, a, 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 there is provision made for a, a, the, the orderly withdrawal from the EU of, of a member, uh, and therefore actions taken for, to facilitate that orderly withdrawal cannot be contrary to EU law, because provision is made in those circumstances. Now, as, you know, as one of the legislators of these islands, uh, we are in that position. But it, there are different opinions. And, you know, m m me weighing in yet again to repeat the opinions which, you know, and the advice I've had from Lord Advocate doesn't take us very far. Uh, there will continue to be a difference of opinion in this matter, uh, I think, right through this process. And we will have to live with that. But it was allowed for within the Scotland Act. And that is extremely important. You know, the, the people who framed the Scotland Act clearly anticipated that this was a possibility. And therefore, we are operating you know, within a rule book, essentially, 
Uh, we, we are doing what we are allowed to do. And at the end of the day, there may or may not, and this is the issue, and again, there will be a difference of opinion, there may or may not be a reference to the Supreme Court. Um, I, I hope there isn't. You know, but also, I, I didn't want to be in this position. I made that clear last week in the chamber. I'll make it clear again today. Uh, and I would rather not be in this position. But we are in the position, and therefore we, we accept it. So we're in the position, obviously, because we've got a, a position where the UK government has still failed to move that just that extra bit forward. So, And if they did so, obviously, we or the Scottish government would consider withdrawing the continuity um, legislation. So I saw there was some comment in the Times yesterday, it was a UK government spokesperson was saying that they didn't think the UK government would move the, the extra for, forward. Um, how likely do you think that is? Well, I, I, fortunately, I, I don't undertake my negotiations entirely on the basis of what the Times or the Scotsman or the Herald or anybody else publishes on their front page. Otherwise, I would be, I would be blown by every single wind that blows. Uh, you know, we, are, we are in a clear position. Um, I, I said in a television interview on Sunday, speaking through a blizzard uh, a, from Colin Trive, that you know, no matter the circumstances, I would continue to negotiate, and that the basis of that negotiation would be on uh, respecting the devolved uh, settlement, and that required you know, our consent uh, in terms of the frameworks. That remains now. Consent or agree, those are important words. That remains where we are. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Mark Drakeford and myself will be at a, a, a meeting of the JMCEN tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we hope to bring you know, further thought and, and ideas to bear, and we will continue to have that conversation. Adam. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, good morning, Minister. Um, did, I, I wonder if the Minister heard what Professor Page had to say about the issue of um, competence um, and compatibility with EU law being, in his words, um, something of a red herring, and whether the minister would want to reflect on that. I, I did hear what he said, and I would probably want to reflect on that, but probably not instantly. I'd want to study what Professor Page has said, and we, we do take very serious consideration of all the views uh, of experts on this field, and, you know, and your own too. Your exchange with the Lord Advocate uh, uh, last week was you know, of significance, and we understand how significant it is. I don't know if either of my legal colleagues want to reflect upon what Professor Page said, um, but we will, we will certainly consider it. And I heard his views. Can I, can I then um, on, on, on two specifics. So, I mean, you know, we all understand that um, acting compatibly with EU law is not the only constraint on our legislative competence. Um, we are also required to act only within devolved competence and not to trespass onto reserved functions um, uh, as provided for in Schedules 4 and 5 to the Scotland Act. Um, and a couple of specifics um, uh, in this bill have been raised as you know, um, examples of provisions that would appear, uh, at least on one reading, um, to do exactly that, that is to say, to trespass onto reserved um, functions. So the um, uh, provision uh, in the bill that, per that, that enables um, Scottish ministers to set a different day than 29th of March 2019 as exit day uh, is an example, and the whole of Section 6, which provides for the uh, ongoing status um, or provides for the limitations, I should say, to the ongoing status of the principle of the supremacy of EU law and Scots law after exit day uh, would, would appear to be another. These are examples of provisions in the Act that, um, uh, as I say, trespass on reserved competence and are therefore incompetent for this Parliament to, to pass. Now, I did ask the Lord Advocate last week um, about this, but he declined to answer it with any level of specificity. So I wonder if, Minister, you or your officials this morning would be prepared to just okay. walk me through the reasons why, in the Scottish Government's view, um, these provisions and others like them uh, are within competence, not out with competence. Okay, let me deal with the overall question, and then I'll deal with the specific items, and I'll ask Alison Cole to talk about Section 6, which is better qualified to do than, than I am. In the overall principle, we don't believe the bill relates to reserve matters, and that's you know, clearly the position we have. Uh, a, a, an objection has been raised, for example, that it relates to reserve matters and international relations, including relations to the EU. It, it doesn't. It's about domestic law. The, the, that reservation contains an express exception exception concerning the implementation in domestic law of international obligations in EU law, and that's what the bill does. Uh, it deals with the implementation in devolved areas of the UK government's decision to leave the EU. That's what it's designed to do. The purpose of the bill is to make provision within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament consequential in the decision of the UK to withdraw. So our view is that it is within uh, competence. Now, in terms of the, the specifics you have raised, on the exit day, um, I, I, I feel 
very much that we are damned if we do and damned if we don't on Exit Day. Exit Day was a huge issue in the passage through the House of Commons. There was very strong pressure to put onto the bill the, the date itself. The date was put on it, and then another group of people swept in from the other side of the argument and said it shouldn't be there. So what the compromise, uh, I think I think it may be Michael Clancy who quoted this, who quoted the actual provision and evidence to you, is it gives the date, but it also gives a, a power to a minister to amend the date. I am more than willing to look at an amendment, and I confirm this to the Delegated Powers Committee, which I think the convener referred to this morning. I'm more than willing to look at an amendment that does exactly the same sort of thing. It is neither our intention, nor do we believe it is our ability, to set a different date. Uh, you know, we, we, are, we are not in that business. But if it is possible to improve the bill in that way, I don't believe it's out of competence, but if it's impossible to improve the bill in that way, we will improve the bill in that way. Would, is, a, is a function which is itself reserved to the and, and, to, and to, we to can ministers recognize, of the Crown. We can recognise that reservation quite easily because you know, we are not endeavouring in the bill to take a power to set a date or a different date. Right. That is not what we are doing. What we are doing is accepting that, that that date will be set by the UK government. We then come down to this head of a pin, whether that date could or could not be changed. And of course, there is a, a dispute about that, whether it could or could not be changed and who it be set. But... I recognise this date will be set by UK ministers, uh, and we're not going to set it. We're not endeavouring to shove in somewhere, you know, oops, we said 2029 rather than 2019. That's not what we're into. So you know, I'll give you my reassur assurance on that, and we'll bring, endeavour to bring an amendment. Perhaps Alison would like to address the competence of Section 6. Yeah, well, I'll cover exit D briefly as well, and I suppose our position, I think the Lord Advocate maybe did address this, is that we are required to act compatibly with EU law, uh, and in exercising that power, we would need to exercise it in a way that um, fits in with the exit day that uh, is under the treaties, um, which is currently 29th March. So, but as the Minister said, we are looking at uh, whether we can make the position clearer. On supremacy of EU law, uh, our position would be that that is part and parcel of the whole range of EU law that we are bringing into domestic law. Uh, as part of the preparations for exit. So uh, the general principles, the charter, the incorporation, saving of retained EU law, it is one of the EU law concepts which we have to deal with and we need to see what the position is. And what we're seeking to do is the same as the UK government in their bills to say basically that uh, the supremacy of EU law applies in the same way as it currently does to the law that we bring across. Okay, but I, I still don't. I, I mean, I, I understand the policy intention, but I, I still don't understand um, how you or how the Scottish government considers um, that this Parliament legislating for that is compatible with the reservation in Schedule Five that reserves international relations, including relations between the UK and the EU and its institutions. Mm -hmm. And the Court of Justice is one of those institutions, and the doctrine of supremacy relates to the relates directly to the relationship between the UK legal systems and the, that institution of the EU. So how does, that, how does this provision, in your view, not trespass on that reserved function? That's can what I, I, don't, that's what to, I don't understand. To, to address that, to see if we can provide additional information that will assist. I think it's important to look at what Section 6 will do were it to be enacted. Although it is about the subject of the supremacy of EU law, it would no longer be about the relationship between EU law as part of the supranational legal order and our domestic law because we would have, the UK would have ceased to have been a member state of the EU. If yeah, you actually look at what right. Section 6 will do after, and uh, as, as Lord Advocate made clear, this bill can only take effect after UK withdrawal, it will become a set of principles about how, what, what, what that former principle of supremacy means in the context of Scots law as part of the UK, uh, a, a country that used to be a member state. I understand the provision, but I mean I understand the position, but I think there is a grave issue here about whether this is um, whether this is competent. But we, we we will have to agree to differ on that. We believe that the arguments we put forward mean that it is competent, and of course the Lord Advocate uh, contends it is competent. But I am quite happy to you know consider uh, further questions on that, and to take, for example, a question in writing, and to see if we can we can answer it from you. Thank you, James. Uh, thanks, as, as you outlined at the start, uh, Minister, there, there are clearly different positions in terms of the view on legal competence. There's a view from the presiding officer and there's a view from the Lord Advocate, which is, is supported by the government. Um, and 
there's a potential, as you said, that you know we may end up in the regrettable situation that this is in the courts, and that's something that you know none of us want. Um, however, in order, to, and you said discussions were ongoing, you know, between legal officers, um, and the hope would be that we could get some resolution. However, in order to, you know. For, it, put, it puts MSPs in a, a difficult position because we're in uncharted territory here. But in order to inform this debate, which has become, unfortunately, has become part of the consideration of the bill, um, I, I perfectly understand the government's view that they don't. It's not their normal policy to publish legal advice. Um, but would you take on board the view of the Law Society that, given the public interest here, that there's a case for both the presiding officer and the, the Lord Advocate publishing the legal advice to inform these discussions? Um, I do understand it, and I heard the, the evidence of the, the Law Society. However, we have already undertaken, of course, an exceptional state permitted under the Ministerial Code, in which the Lord Advocate has uh, indicated the, uh, the, the reasons that the, the, the government, and I stress that, the reasons that the government has uh, taken the action it has, um, by saying that why we believe this is within competence. He has also gone further. He has you know, come to the chamber and he has answered questions from members on those matters. Uh, and that is an exceptional step to take. Uh, it is not presently, uh, and I have to say it is not the view of the government, that we should then move into not only completely uncharted waters, but waters that would set, uh, we think, a very difficult and dangerous precedent if we were then to publish uh, or give further uh, legal advice. So that is not the intention so to do. I understand where the Law Society is, I understand where you are, but we don't believe that there, that there would be benefit in so doing. Um, and that is uh, where we stand. But do you accept that, that, that puts the, the MSPs are in a difficult position here because this has become you know, part of the debate as to whether this legislation is, is is legally competent. And we need, you know, part of this, you know, I, I, we understand, from La Scottish Labour's perspective, we understand why you're bringing this legislation forward. And, you know, we, we support that in principle. However, we're in a difficult position with regards this legal advice. And it's important for MSPs across the chamber to have as great an understanding as possible as to the, the two different positions here? Well, we have indicated very clearly, again this morning, uh, in publication, in statements, why the Scottish Government believes this is uh, a, a, a competent, and we have given legal reasons for that. We have indicated why. The, the, the presiding officer has published his statement, and there was no limit to his statement. He could have published as much or as little as he wished. He has published his statement, why he believes that not to be the case. We've heard distinguished uh, scholars this, this morning give their opinions uh, on, on that matter. This will, with the greatest respect, never be in definitive. Uh, there is a difference of opinion on this matter. It will only, it could only be definitive in the end. It was tested in the courts, and as the Lord Advocate has indicated, in his view, if the position that he has taken, it, 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 it would, was defective, then so would be the position of the UK bill. So I think. With the greatest respect, and I'm not trying to be difficult, I cannot give you any comfort on that at all. Uh, the Lord Advocate has taken exceptional steps. Uh, the, the presiding officer has published, a, I think, a lengthier statement than I, I believe he has ever published before. Uh, there are other contributors to this. That is where we are. Okay. <clears throat> how, how do I want to express this? If there's disagreement currently, and even though we, both the Lord Advocate, the Scottish Government and the presiding officer published in full what their legal advice was, I suspect that disagreement would still be there. I, I, and I, I, and I, therefore, I agree. And therefore, in that context, it doesn't really... We might have more text to read, but it doesn't actually change the context of the decision that MSPs have got to make their decision. I, I, I suspect that if the Archangel Gabriel were to come down and define what legal advice he was to give, uh, there would still be a dispute about it. I don't think it's going to produce the clarity that people wish. Adam's got a supplementary on that. No. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with you, Minister, about this. I, I think that um, legal advice to governments should only be published in very exceptional um, circumstances. But there is an alternative which might... Um, you said you couldn't offer any comfort to, to Mr Kelly, but I wonder if you would consider this. Um, the Lord Advocate 
um, could refer the competence of this bill directly to the Supreme Court, because he is a law officer who is able to do that under the terms of the Scotland Act 1998. The, um, his um, equivalent uh, legal counsel, I think it's called in Wales, has done that formally um, in, uh, with regard to a, a Welsh uh, statute, which was referred by the Government of Wales to the Supreme Court in order to test its varies. Would the Scottish Government undertake um, if it's so confident about uh, the Lord Advocate's legal advice to refer the competence of this bill directly to the Supreme Court? Well, I think the reason that we wouldn't, that it may not happen, and I can't, you know, I can't make a commitment one way or the other, though I think it's highly unlikely, is that because uh, we are confident in the advice that we've had the Lord Advocate that this is entirely within competence, uh, and therefore we don't believe it needs to be tested in that way. But, you know, I, I, I can't, and you wouldn't expect me to give that commitment at this meeting, and I think it is highly unlikely. But I have heard what you have said, and no doubt the Lord Advocate has heard what you have said. Neil? Uh, legal advice should only be published in very exceptional circumstances, and the Ministerial Code makes provision for that if ministers believe it's in the public interest, and obviously the Law Society of Scotland have uh, said they believe it is. Um, <clears throat> can I ask you, have you received any, other, any legal advice from anyone other than the Lord Advocate? Well, I'm not at liberty to give that information. Uh, you know, the ministers do not talk about the legal advice that they've given, and you know that is a, an answer that I have, and other ministers have given regularly around this table. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should, I don't think we should become totally hooked on this. We have done, and the Lord Advocate has has taken the steps he is entitled to take in exceptional circumstances, and those are laid out in the ministerial code, uh, because we recognise the exceptional nature of these circumstances. That is what has happened. Moreover, he has made himself available for questioning in the chamber on this issue, and that is absolutely unique. So I think that is a considerable contribution to, 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 to understanding, but I agree with the convener. I don't think the publication of any amount of legal advice would actually change things. You said you're not at liberty to say, but the Ministerial Code say, states that in exceptional circumstances that legal advice can be published if ministers believe it in the public I interest. I am not in the position to say, and I will not be giving any information on that, because I'm bound, I believe I'm bound by the Ministerial Code. So the area and the competence issue, we move on to the areas around necessity. Willie? Thank you very much, Convener Minister. I wonder if I could just ask you to give a comment or two about the overall timing of the bill, the Scottish Bill, um, clearly there's a view that there's an urgency attached to this, uh, uh, that time is moving fast and running out and so on and so forth. But there's another view that perhaps we don't need to do this until later on or the last minute or even not at all. Could you just outline what the advantages in the Scottish Government view are of bringing it in now and what the risks are if we don't act now? Well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Graham to come in in a moment because this was a question that was asked yesterday at the uh, Delegated Powers Committee and Graham provided a, a written explanation of this and I think all members are to receive it because I think the it was sent to the convener of the Delegated Powers Committee who undertook to circulate it. I don't know if it has been circulated as yet, but it will give you a written explanation. Precise. Has it been circulated? Precisely? I think it was received as the, as the, as the committee. Right. Not long ago, so it's about to be circulated. Okay, so there is, but suffice to say, and I'll ask Graham to give the, the legal detail. But from our, the perspective that we are, in which we are operating, we require, and we understand, we require to have this bill passed before and have royal assent before uh, the UK bill has is passed and has royal assent. Now, Michael Clancy laid out the timetable to which the UK government is operating. It's worth saying that that timetable has slipped and continues to slip. Slip the the timetable originally for that bill was for the end of last year. Uh, there were difficulties with it in the Commons. The, t the Lord's timetable is for 10 days at uh, uh, the committee stage. It is on day four and is already slipping, we understand, at, at the time, so it may well take longer. There is then a report stage to be had. We don't believe that this bill is likely to be ready for royal assent in, in the UK until sometime in early May at the very earliest. So that is the timescale. Now, because Scottish bills require once passed to have a month's lying time, I suppose you could call it in, in old practice, uh, under which, uh, as Professor Tompkins has indicated, there could be a challenge to it. Uh, and then you add the period of royal assent. Working back from that, it would appear that this is the last possible moment. Um, and therefore, and we have held off. I mean, I would say, you know, we have restrained ourselves very much by saying we want to get uh, a, re a resolution uh, through negotiation. And we've only, alongside our Welsh colleagues, only enacted, brought this to the, to, to the respective chambers, where at the very last moment we felt that we could do so, and that's where we are. In terms of legislative consent, 
were we to bring forward a legislative consent motion, and the procedure is, is slightly different in Wales and Scotland, um, that would have to be done before the last amending stage of the bill, and that is report stage in the House of Lords. So that would require to be done sometime in the second half of April, certainly after Easter. But uh, perhaps Graham might want to indicate the, the issues, and probably important just to quote from the letter that has gone. Yes, it's partly a marginal issue and further to those issues which the Minister's just outlined and, and indeed spoken to before uh, in relation to the, the need to amend the EU withdrawal bill if necessary, uh, if in the event that the legislative consent motion is, is refused by the Parliament and also in view of the legislative, practical legislative work to prepare for Brexit that follows on and which needs some kind of settled position between the two bills. But there, there's also um, some more technical reasons um, buried in the detail of the EU withdrawal bill about um, the potential interaction of the two bills in the sense that there's a, an amendment in Schedule 3, it's paragraph 19.2b of the EU withdrawal bill, which would amend the Scotland Act and which would make the EU withdrawal bill, if it's in, in due course um, passed into law, it would make that a protected enactment in terms of the Scotland Act, so it couldn't be amended or modified by an act of the Scottish Parliament, and that may come to have some bearing on the operation of the continuity bill and for that reason and also the, the, the timing issues that have been um, adverted to by the Minister and I think by the, the witnesses that the, the committee heard earlier this morning um, in terms of the timings that's you know one of the, the other reasons for, for the urgency of bringing forward the, the bill at this pace. Okay. Where does it leave us then if, uh, if the LCM is refused and we didn't have this bill where does it leave us? Well, it, 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 it leaves us with, it would depend whether the constitutional conventions were being observed or not. And, you know, there's, Professor Tompkins has raised earlier this morning, I know in question, the issue of the word uh, normal, normally. Uh, but normally what would happen is that the sections of the bill to which we could not consent would be removed from the bill. Um, and that would create, obviously, some considerable difficulties. So that's one of the strong reasons for having something to, to, to take its place, so that we don't have that legislative cliff edge which would take place. Uh, and that is, a, I think, a, a positive intention, you know, that we, we have said regularly to stakeholders across Scotland, particularly to businesses, that we don't want to see a legislative cliff edge, and therefore we need to put something in to stop that happening. Thank you. On, on that question, uh, Minister Tavish Scott, I think it was, asked the, this question of the Lord Advocate last week, and the Lord Advocate politely declined to answer it on the basis that he considered it to be speculative. But given that we are considering the general principles of legislation and we need to be looking forward, uh, I hope perhaps you'll um, not rest on that and, and actually give this um, a, 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 um, a substantive answer. And it's a direct follow-up to Willie Coffey's question. If the um, devolution provisions, for want of a better expression, of the withdrawal bill are removed because uh, this place or um, Cardiff Bay declines to give consent. And if this legislation is enacted um, uh, by this parliament, I know this is a third if, and if it, that this legislation is then challenged in the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court strikes down this legislation, then isn't it the case uh, that Scotland, will be, well, Scotland would have absolutely no legal ability whatsoever to correct its statute book? so that it's meaningful and ready for exit day? Um, I, I know the Lord Advocate didn't want to speculate, but speculation is the stuff of politics. So if you're a politician, you're more willing to speculate. I don't think it, chronologically that can happen. Right? And I think that the, 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 the lacunae is in uh, the question. Because I think the time you would, and I'm sure you do, but just to outline the timescales involved, <coughs> let us, and there's a very helpful chart on timescales which we can let the committee have that looks at the, the passage of the bills. The UK bill is likely to pass in, let us say, the middle of May, right? A, and have royal assent, at its earliest, roughly royal assent. So let us assume for those circumstances that it is passed um, as presently is, and there is no legislative consent, and they do not remove those, which you, know, you indicated is a, is, a, is a possibility because there could be an argument that these are not normal times and therefore. So that bill is intact. But even if they were removed, you know, it, 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 the, and this bill had been passed, one of two things would happen. If the bill were to be challenged in the courts, and I hope it isn't, 
and it was found to be competent, then it would be in place. If it was found to be incompetent, I think it would flow from that. I would be highly surprised if the UK government did not say to itself, well, we have to have something in place. So I just don't think it's a, it's, 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 the chances of that happening are infinitesimally small. I think it is much more likely that either this bill passes and sits happily with the other bill, <coughs> or at an earlier stage we have an agreement in terms of the UK bill, or the UK bill is, is passed, not changed, uh, in which case I have to say that deepens the constitutional crisis. But I think that's much more likely. I don't think those set of circumstances are uh, in any way almost impossible to envisage happening. No, you never say impossible. You never say never. But I think it's very, very unlikely. Well, had you concluded your area? Okay. Yeah. Mordo. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, we had a discussion in the, the previous session about the need for the continuity bill to be complementary to the withdrawal bill. And this is where timing becomes important because the Scottish Government want to see the uh, continuity bill proceed as emergency legislation. Parliament has indeed agreed to that. It will therefore be concluded and, uh, on the statute book before completion of the withdrawal bill. And the withdrawal bill is subject to change at later stages. So we could end up with uh, a lack of complementarity. Doesn't that mean, therefore, that this, this rush to legislate could, could lead to us having bad law and, and gaps in legislation? I don't believe so, and I, I would respectfully say that I don't think we're rushing to legislate, we're res legislating out of necessity, and I've indicated that in, in the answer. But I don't think so, um, I, I, and I think the reality of that can be found in, in two possible approaches to this. The first one is, this is not where we wish to be. And, you know, we are still endeavouring to reach an agreement with the UK government on the overall uh, UK bill. Uh, and therefore, that agreement may still be reached. And if that agreement were reach, reached, then that question does not arise. <laughs> on the second one, um, you know, we would wish to be able to uh, study very carefully any ambiguities that arise and find ways to correct them. That is not an impossibility. It has happened in other legislative circumstances, and we would study it very carefully. Uh, we, we have made some changes in this bill that we hope would improve the process, but we don't think it's by any means impossible for those who are operating under the two bills, and that, for example, has happened quite often in European legislation, where careful decisions have to be made about what lies in one area and what, what lies in another area, and we will be prepared for that. I, I've never maintained that this is the ideal situation, but I am confident with, with, with thought and care that situation can be taken care of um, and we can make sure that there is not incompatibility. And a great deal of work has gone into trying to make sure that these bills do uh, complement each other so that there is a workable solution. And we believe that we have found that workable solution. But again, it is not our first option, and I just stress that. So if, if in the situation that I've outlined, if there are subsequent amendments required, would you see these being done by regulation or by another piece of primary legislation? Well, I'm not saying that we would require amendment, but if it were, if it were to be required, that would be a matter for you know, full, frank and open exchange with the Chamber and with everybody, with the entire Parliament. But I don't anticipate that that will happen. I anticipate you know, that we will find an orderly and, and, and proper way to conduct business through the two bills, uh, de dealing with people who make those judgments every single day. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if Alison might like to add to that, because Alison is yeah. one of those people whose judgment we trust in these matters. Well, so, as the Minister said, I mean, uh, there's a timing issue here, and at the moment the bill is, co is complementary with some different choices uh, in relation to the UK bill. There is a risk, and this is the risk you've identified, of the UK bill being amended subsequently at a point when this bill has been passed. I think I would say that's a relatively small risk in terms of causing the sorts of problems that you're um, suggesting might arise. I suppose simply because in terms of the amendments that are being discussed, most of those are amendments that relate to things we've already taken a different choice on, actually. That's where some of the pressure comes from amendments. And on your question about how would we make, if, if such an issue does arise, we do have the ancillary powers under the bill. Now, they might not work in all cases, but that would provide a potential mechanism to sort out any small rubs that there might be with subsequent amendments. Do, do you want to? I, I think that it's just important to note that 
you know, there's been obviously considerable disagreement between the UK and Scottish governments over a, a lot of things, but where there's been an absolute unity of purpose since the very beginning, this is set out in December 2016 in Scotland's place in Europe, is that both governments have recognised the need for this task to be done to avoid the cliff edge. Already, um, under the anticipated use of the EU withdrawal bill between the two governments, there's been um, discussion and arrangement at official level to see how that cooperation might work. I think that the, 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 the two governments share the ambition of avoiding the cliff edge. The, 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 the dispute so far has just been about precisely how to go about that. It's a very important point. I, I, I had my first discussion about this bill um, uh, with um, Ben Gummer, who was then the Cabinet Office Minister in, in the previous administration, I think in uh, sometime in December 2016. And you know, we have recognised, we do not wish the UK to leave the EU, you know, I mean, I don't really, nobody in any doubt about my position on, on Brexit, but we have recognised the need to have a, a set of laws that avoid chaos and confusion. And that still remains our view. You know, we are still trying to avoid that, and we will continue to try to avoid it. Just, just, just one more point about timing. Um, in the last session, Professor McHarg said, and I wrote this down, the urgency is a tactical urgency. Isn't that really the case? This is really more about politics than it is about the law. It's more about your negotiating position in relation to the UK government rather than it is about trying to improve the, the law of Scotland. Uh, no, and I've indicated my answer to Mr Coffey and in Graham's uh, answer and in the letter which is being uh, uh, circulated to you, the legal reasons why the sequencing has to take place as it's taking place. OK, I've got quite a few people who indicated previously they want to take part in this session. So, Ivan, have you still got a question in this one? Uh, yeah, just uh, just briefly, yeah. Um, and um, thanks, and thanks, uh, Minister and panel, for coming to talk to us. The, um, it centres around the same issue that I raised with the earlier panel, um, exactly where we are in terms of the political negotiations, and but more fundamentally than that, what lies behind that, because we talk about the difference between consent and consult and how much ground each party is given, etc., between the Scottish and the UK governments um, on, on where we go with, um, with, with frameworks, etc. But at the core, really, and we can talk about the, the, the legal easing about this, but the, at the core of the reality is it centres around about whether the Scottish Parliament keeps the powers it's got or whether it loses the, the, the ability to legislate in areas that, uh, that, it, that it rightly does so under the devolution settlement. So I don't know if you just want to reflect on where, as much as you can tell us on where we are with the discussions with the UK government, but also reflect on that fundamental principle and um, the, the reality that there isn't actually that much give and take when it comes down to that principle. I, I, I do I do sometimes feel as if I'm, you know, that person described in Palmerston's description of the people who understand the Slyzwick Holstein question. You know, that one had gone mad, one had died and the other one had forgotten it. This is a very, very complicated set of things. I'm trying to uh, allow me to try and be as general as I can. Uh, and you know, everybody would fall asleep where I could go into the, the extraordinary and excruciating detail of it all. But at the heart of this, is the issue of how a bill is prepared that requires legislative consent. You know, the, the, the usual way that such a bill would be prepared is that there would be regular contact between officials on, in both administrations to make sure that this bill would, would, would be operable in terms of legislative consent. Now, you know, that has not applied to this bill. I indicated that I had a conversation with the then Cabinet Office Minister who was responsible for the bill, Ben Gummer, in probably December 16. The responsibility of the bill kept changing between him and David Davis. Con you know, but there was a proposal that Ben would come and sit down and discuss with ministers and with officials what this was to look like. That didn't happen. Uh, in January 2017, I raised this bill at the JMC plenary uh, in Cardiff uh, with the Prime Minister and indicated that an early indication of content and timescale would be helpful because the bill had been discussed. You remember that the idea of this so-called Great Repeal Bill had been announced at the Tory party conference in 2016. So the, the bill was clearly in preparation. We were told it was in preparation. At that stage, the intention was to, to introduce it in May. So in January, February, we were saying this is getting close to the wire. We need to see this and we need to have a conversation about it. Then in April, uh, an election is called. So clearly no bill is going to be introduced at that time. The commitment continues for the bill. The election takes place on the 8th of June. And very shortly thereafter, our officials continue with discussion. And it's indicated this bill is likely to be published in early July. 
We have not seen it, but we still haven't seen any detail of it. And I think on the, either the last day of June or the first day of July, uh, our officials are shown a copy of the bill, and it is immediately obvious that we cannot agree to the bill as drafted, primarily because of Clause 11, which uh, it, it takes all the powers uh, devolved, the intersection of powers between devolved, uh, 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 European competence and devolved competence, and they all go to Westminster, and then there's a process in which Westminster can or cannot uh, divvy them up or, or pass them out. I went to London on the 3rd of July, I think, and spoke to David Davis about this at some length and indicated what the situation was. And we then entered into a process of discussion. Um, the Welsh government was in exactly the same position. Uh, we had a meeting later in July in Cardiff uh, between the law officers, ministers and officials, which we agreed to start work on uh, amendments because we wish to be constructive. And this has gone on. There has been little progress on amendments until I think November, when the Prime Minister and the, and the First Minister met, which, although our amendments were published in September, our joint amendments, we made it clear that we objected to the idea of withdrawal, but we were dealing with the technicalities. Around about November, there was an indication, I think, given the, the complete strength of this view across Scottish civic society, uh, you know, with the Conservative Party in Scotland indicating their concerns about it, with the Welsh uh, Parliament unanimously indicating their concerns about it, with others involved, um, that there should be some changes. Uh, there was a commitment to look at those. I think in early December there was a commitment given by Damien Green and, and, uh, and uh, David Mundell to John Swinney and I that there would be amendments. The commitment was given in St Andrew's House at the meeting we had there, and the JMC confirmed that. Um, however, there wasn't actually much progress on what there was there was no commitment tabled in the Lord in the Commons, although there was a commitment to do so at report stage, it didn't happen. Um, we only began to see, I think, some movement in February. Of course, David, Damien Green stopped being First Secretary, David Lewington came in. There was a learning period in there. And we began to see some movement in February with an acceptance that rather than take the approach of, of taking the whole lot, there would be a, a very much smaller group essentially Clause 11 would be turned on its head. Very welcome progress. But the basic issue of consent by the devolved administrations to anything that happens to their powers has still not been agreed. So all the rest, we've had very detailed, what have been called deep dives into some of the areas on possible frameworks. We've always said that we could agree on the principle and frameworks. But the issue of, of consent or agreement, which is central to respect for the devolved settlements has not been agreed. I'm sorry, Convener, that's taken so long, but we are now up to date. And there's another meeting tomorrow. That was one of your short I was, for which I am renowned. I even I'm happy with that. <laughs> and James. Thanks, <laughs> Convener. It's already becoming clear that there's, there's a complexity um, to this bill and that there are, there are going to at least be proposals for amendments. We've heard that from the Law Society this morning, and there was discussion in the previous session about Section 13 and Section 17. Um, bearing in mind the, the timetable for that is amendments have got to be lodged by Friday and then they'll be considered uh, on Tuesday. Uh, is there not a... Uh, bearing in mind the c complexity of this and the potential volume of amendments, uh, is there not a danger that at the pace that we're moving at, that scrutiny will be compromised and the end product won't be as good and that potentially will give some exposure to a legal challenge? Well, we are between a rock and a hard place. Of course, you know, one would want to see as much scrutiny as was physically possible during that period. I mean, I'm very grateful to the imagination and flexibility of, of the Bureau and parliamentary staff and the presiding officer for devising, for example, uh, next uh, Tuesday, a, a way in which we can have a chamber discussion about possible amendments and then the proper process of amendments. And I offer my apologies to you for the fact that this committee will be required to, to meet in the evening, but I know that the, the convener will ensure that uh, pizza and other things are available to you all. <laughs> the convener, yeah, <laughs> sure, will make that, that available. Um, it, it, Stephen's Brady. <laughs> okay. The... Um, 
the, the, the situation is that I, I think I've indicated, indicated to Mr. Coffey, we've indicated, Graham has indicated in the letter that you've got, there is a, a necessity to do this within a, a time scale. Um, you know, we are more than willing to respond to amendments. We're more than willing to be you know, uh, receptive to things. For example, when we've discussed this issue of the, the exit date, you know, I, I think we can just accept that we're going to find a, an amendment. If that amendment is acceptable, I don't think it'll take an awful lot of effort or debate. Perhaps we'll restrict ourselves to the things that will require substantial debate. So, but I'm afraid there is no other comfort I can offer you, Mr. Kelly, than say uh, the legal reasons that Graham has given, uh, the reasons that we've indicated mean that this has to be a time scale uh, uh, that we have to observe the time scale we have. I think it's also. Um relevant to the committee's consideration that the continuity bill as introduced already reflects a number of the recommendations made during scrutiny of the EU withdrawal bill, both in this parliament and when that bill received scrutiny in Westminster. To that extent, it already reflects um, a lot of the, the, the different policy choices in the bill reflect those criticisms. A good example would be the inclusion of a test of necessity before the main powers in the bill can be used. The uh, form of the test of necessity that we have gone for uh, was first raised in a report of the House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee and both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee of the Scottish Parliament and this committee in their interim reports in the bill recommended of the EU withdrawal bill that such a test should be included. That test is now in the continuity bill. Yeah, and, and you know, this was the subject of substantial discussion at the Delegated Powers Committee yesterday, which you know, the official report, and I'm sure a summary of it from SPICE, will indicate the changes that have been made? Uh, the counter to that, obviously that's good legal practice, the counter to that obviously is the discussion that we've had is that the EU withdrawal bill has still got some way to go in terms of progress and there's a danger of inconsistency uh, between the end product of that and the end product of the continuity bill here. And we've indicated what, how we believe that would be dealt with. Okay, Neil, did you have a question in this area? Yeah, just, I mean, we've touched on it, just the, the obviously the principle, we're discussing the principle of legislating here at, at stage one and the principles of the bill and the areas of disagreement with the UK government are, are what's driving forward the, the, the continuity bill and the reason for bringing forward this legislation. It's been suggested there are 25 areas of disagreement. Um, given the timescales, the parliament and the public need to know what those areas are. Yesterday at the Delegated Powers uh, Committee, you said you couldn't publish them, but you hoped that they would be published before stage two. Um, this is obviously a piece of legislation that could have potentially significant uh, consequences, and we have a truncated process. I don't think we have the, the luxury of, of, of being able to wait. So what, 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 why do you think it's acceptable for this to be published ahead of stage two and, and, and not stage one? Well, well the, uh, the same question, of course, was asked to me by Neil Finlay yesterday, and I gave, uh, res respectfully, I'll give you the same answer. I can't unilaterally decide to publish this. Um, I have already spoken to my Welsh counterpart. I will be speaking to him again today. Uh, you know, I, I know he has no objections to that publication, and I will raise this at the meeting tomorrow, and officials have uh, been asked to, to ensure that that knows it will be raised. I hope we will then be able to publish the entire list, again, of 111, indicating what progress has been made with each of them. Nothing Nothing has been agreed because nothing is agreed in such discussions until everything is agreed. But you know, the progress has been made and there are issues in here of importance. But I would stress also, as I stressed to Mr Finlay, this is also about the issue of principle. It is not simply about the issue of particular powers, it's about the issue of making sure that whatever powers this parliament has, they cannot be taken away or, uh, or, or, or hijacked uh, by another parliament without the consent of this parliament. And that has been well put, I have to say, by, by the Welsh, who, you know, Carwyn Jones, as the First Minister of Wales, has made it very, very clear that he cannot go to the National Assembly of Wales and say, these are powers which I am, you know, I have traded away without, uh, uh, because they've simply been asked for. And I'm sure our First Minister couldn't do that either. So we shouldn't lose sight of the principle in this, but we will also try and provide as much detail as possible. Members will have had a, a note from me last night on some of the issues in the bill. It is my intention to keep... Uh, informing uh, members before each stage, as I was asked to do again by the Labour Party, and I'll provide anything I possibly can. But I require to ensure that this is agreed tomorrow, and I'll endeavour to do so. That point, Minister. So what you're saying is, it, in terms of that principle, whether it's 111 powers, 25 powers, or one power, if it's not done by consent and agreement, then the Scottish Government would have issues about it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
uh, as would the, the Welsh government. That we both made that clear. Okay. Neil, sorry. I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think we should know now what, what progress has been made um, by the Scottish and UK governments and their um, negotiations and the expert panel that we had beforehand that agreed that the public and the parliament should know what progress has been made and what agreements have been made. You said that you, you couldn't do it because you didn't have permission from the UK government, but presumably you didn't have permission from the UK government to do the continuity bill. So. I think it is only right that if there is this list that is in the joint ownership of the three of us as the result of work that has been done, that it would be utterly wrong to do ex cathedra. I mean, I've taken a position, for example, on the, the UK uh, uh, government analysis, that if I'm given them, I'll publish them. They know that, therefore they haven't given them to me. I, I don't think I can ex cathedra say anything else, but I am endeavouring to ensure they are published, and I will continue to do so, and I hope that that will be a, a, I will have a result out of that. We're moving into areas of detail now. So, Emma, would you like to begin that session, yes. please? Yes, uh, thanks, Convener. I'll kind of go with the same questions that I asked uh, the previous panel, um, which was relating to the terms of parliamentary scrutiny and improvements that the Continuity Bill have in order to, I guess, compare or, or scrutinise secondary legislation. The, the Law Society's submission says that they recommend that the Scottish Government immediately commences a programme of consultation on the draft subordinate legislation which will be needed under the Bill. So, the Continuity Bill, uh, the answer that Alan Page and uh, Aileen McCarr gave us was that there would be the ability to scrutinise secondary, le secondary legislation better with the Continuity Bill. I'm going to ask Alison to come in on this, but can I just make a, a point in terms of uh, the DPLR committee and what it asked for. Uh, in, its, um, it, in its report on the, the UK bill, it, it recommended that the power should only be available where ministers can show it's necessary to make a change to the statute book. Uh, we made that change, that's sections 11 and 12. They recommended that UK ministers should only be able to legislate in devolved areas with the consent of the devolved administration. We made that change, section 17. They recommended an explanatory statement should accompany each instrument. We've made that change, section 16. They asked the governments to consider whether the Scottish ministers should be able to use a made affirmative or an urgent procedure for their instruments. Uh, we made this change. And they asked us to consider whether the Scottish ministers should have ancillary powers. We made that change. So you know, we've responded very positively to ideas about changing the scrutiny of these bills. I also yesterday in evidence to the committee said that, for example, the criteria which are, we have you know, are in the bill for um, ensuring something is affirmative, super affirmative or affirmative, if there are changes that members would wish to see to those criteria, then I am willing to consider changes to those criteria. I think we have to have a criteria-based system for making that decision. I don't think we can do it in a random way. I think we have to decide clearly why something is super affirmative, why something is affirmative, and why, therefore, the other items are, are negative. But if there are changes to that, I think we have, on super affirmative, if I remember correctly, it's to do with a, 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 a new power, it's to do with a new body, um, or it's to do with a... What's the third one? I'm sure Luke is very good on the third one, always, the, when I get to that stage. The enhanced affirmative procedure is available where our regulations to establish a new Scottish public authority, give a function to a newly established Scottish public authority, or remove a current EU function without replacing it. Absolutely, perfectly done. There, there, so, you know, we, we've got criteria there, but if we add another criteria, if there's another criteria that seems sensible, we'll consider adding it. But I, I am very keen that we have the clarity of criteria applied in those circumstances. But Alison would like to... Yeah, to I was just on the point of consultation. So I think we have committed to consult as widely as we possibly can, including on draft instruments. Uh, on the point about we should be starting that consultation now, I do have a bit of a difficulty with that, to be honest, because we don't actually know what the destination is. And it would be very, very difficult to have draft instruments um, to, to deal with the position. And the UK government hasn't published any draft instruments, hasn't started any consultations. We have done a lot of work to identify where there are EU references that will need to change, but you very quickly run into, well, what is the choice that you're making? And at this point in time, it's, it's almost impossible possible to, to know what that choice would be because we don't have the withdrawal agreement and we don't have agreement. Okay. On consultation, the continuity bill contains, unlike the EU withdrawal bill, a statutory requirement for consultation in certain circumstances. When the enhanced procedure applies and those three, when those 
one of those three criteria that the Minister indicated has met, then the Scottish Ministers must consult on the proposal before laying the regulations and must provide a copy of the consultation to the Scottish Parliament at that point. The Scottish Parliament then gets 60 rather than 40 days to scrutinise the regulations. And when the regulations are laid, the Scottish Ministers must include in the explanatory material a report on that consultation, an indication of the consultation responses they received and an indication of any changes they made as a result of that consultation. So unlike the EU withdrawal bill, a statutory process for consultation is built into the continuity bill. Can I just give you one example, which I think will illustrate it and, and help to set it at rest? Um, I, because it does actually also indicate the work we are doing. I've met on several occasions with the health sector and the pharmaceutical sector in particular. We know that there is a strong desire to continue with the European Medicines Agency. We know that the UK government has now indicated they want to do that. We also know that there are difficulties never been done before in these circumstances if you're outside the EEA. So it would be very difficult for us to consult on a draft instrument on that. But we are in dialogue regularly with the sector about what they want and how they want it done. Yes, I think so. That's Thank fine. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Patrick. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Just to, to continue this, this theme of, of scrutiny, um, I can uh, recognise what's been argued for in terms of, of specific criteria and, and laying out in the bill uh, where uh, a negative, an affirmative or an enhanced affirmative uh, or super affirmative procedure would be used. Uh, is it reasonable uh, and is the government open to the argument uh, that uh, an additional criteria ought to be parliamentary will uh, and that some mechanism for uh, sifting through uh, the, the government's uh, draft instruments uh, ought to, to come to parliament, either to a, a single committee or to subject committees, uh, for parliament then to decide whether uh, a particular measure ought to be escalated uh, uh, up that ladder of, uh, of, of scrutiny procedures. I, I, we're not absolutely resistant to the idea of a sifting committee, though the, the difficulty of a sifting committee would be, given that this is a very pressured process, it would add to the process. So clearly you wouldn't have to deal with the ones that are already dealt with super affirmative because they couldn't be put up the ladder, right? I, I think the issue lies in the affirmative area um, and in the negative area, clearly. I, I'd want to see it criteria-based. Um, so if there was, if a, an additional criteria was to be parliamentary will, I'd want to see how that was defined and how it operated, but I'm not absolutely resistant to that in any way. I do want to see as much scrutiny as there possibly can be, but I am. I think the criteria-based system placed in the bill is very helpful because it does guide everybody what the situation should be. So maybe rather than a sifting committee, there should be a, a procedure for objecting to it um, on the grounds of criteria not being met or, or whatever, uh, and for decisions to be made. I'm just nervous about putting in another process that's going to hold things up even further, given the nature of this. I, I absolutely take the point about pressure of time, uh, and there is, there is, uh, as I think uh, you've, you've argued in other contexts, no perfect way through this, uh, this, this whole uh, constitutional crisis that, that Brexit represents. But uh, I, I would say that it's, it's in the interest of the government uh, to ensure that the instruments it brings forward are capable of gaining parliamentary support. Uh, and if, uh, if one way of doing that is to ensure that Parliament is satisfied that there's been enough consultation, for example, um, that's in the interest of, of seeing the thing through uh, uh, efficiently and, and to a, an agreeable outcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of speculating aloud here, which is probably a bad idea, but I wonder if there is a role for an objection process to the Bureau so that that can be handled as part of the business process. I'm very happy to discuss that. You're open to exploring yes, this absolutely. area. Uh, two other areas I'd like to uh, ask about then. Uh, section 31 uh, is about the uh, situation where urgent cases uh, require uh, instruments to be, to be uh, made or, or regulations or orders to be made prior to parliamentary approval. Um, can you first of all uh, give us a, an indication of what kind of situations you think that that urgent case might apply to? Uh, and secondly, um, I'm told that uh, the Scottish Government's guidelin uh, guidance states that SSIs must be laid before the Scottish Parliament as soon as practicable after making uh, in practice, this means SSIs are generally laid on the second working day after making, which allows the required 24 hours for SSI registration. Uh, and then 
separate to that guidance, um, according to our standing orders, uh, if SSIs are not received within three days, then the DPLR committee uh, is required to determine whether an instrument should be drawn to the attention of the Parliament on the grounds that there appears to have been an unjustifiable delay. Would it be your intention to stick with that timing, that expectation that instruments are laid that quickly? Uh, and if so, if so uh, shouldn't the, the bill uh, place that as a requirement? Well, as it exists as a requirement, um, I, I don't think it's necessary to state it, but yes, it would be my intention. Uh, and I mean, I make that commitment. Can I ask Luke to answer the, the wider question on, 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 on the SSIs? The need for the urgent procedure arises, I, I think, principally because of the deadline that everybody is working to, unless something dramatic happens, the UK is leaving the European Union on the 29th of March 2017. The principal fixing powers expire two years after that. There are clearly um, some changes everyone accepts that will need to be made in order to keep laws effectively functioning by then. It is still not clear the precise scenario in which the UK will be leaving the EU, either in terms of the ultimate relationship between the EU and the UK or the terms of any transitional deal. And it may not become clear until quite late in the process. The urgent procedure was taken by the UK government in the EU withdrawal bill, and it was a recommendation of the delegated powers uh, committee that the Scottish government consider whether they should also have a similar procedure in the Scottish Parliament. Um, it is taken in, um, in the anticipation that there may prove to be situations where something needs to come to the Parliament very quickly, either because the uh, change required only becomes clear at the last minute or because substantial lead-in preparation is required to make sure that, for example, a public body is set up in time in order that it can assume functions on exit day. I think the, the, the Minister has given, and the, the accompanying documents to the Bill also give, a commitment that this will only be used when absolutely necessary. Under the procedure, um, regulations must be laid before the Scottish Parliament as soon as practicable after they are made. And the Minister has already said that as far as we're concerned, that means the existing requirement that they are laid normally within two sitting days. And they will cease to have effect unless approved by the Parliament within 28 sitting days of being made. So in every single case where an urgent procedure instrument is made, the Parliament will be involved in the decision whether it remains in force. I accept the, 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 the basic argument that there may be circumstances in which uh, this kind of power is necessary. At the same time, it's a very significant step to give ministers the ability to change the law and then ask for parliamentary approval afterwards. Um, is there anything uh, under the bill as it stands that would prevent that, for example, being done during a parliamentary recess and therefore uh, a significant delay before... Parliament had the opportunity to make a decision? No, there isn't. And that's an important point. Uh, and I think we should reflect upon that point, um, that there isn't. This is, you know, I've, I said yesterday, I've said again you know, quite clearly today, this is there because a backstop and a safeguard is required. It is certainly not our intention to use it, and we hope not to use it. But I think you are raising, for example, in the parliamentary recess issue, a very important point. Just to confirm uh, for Mr Harvey, the... the Procedural requirement about 28 sitting days would kick in when the Parliament returned from recess in that, uh, in that situation. Let's look at that. Okay. Let's look at that now as a matter of urgency. Thank you. The, there was one other area on the, 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 the subject of parliamentary scrutiny, and that's section 17, uh, which uh, gives ministers uh, the, the power to uh, consent, or I suppose to refuse consent for regulations which are made by UK ministers which touch on devolved areas. Uh, again, can you give us examples of what kind of regulations we might be talking about here uh, and why that consent should be given by Scottish ministers rather than by the Scottish Parliament? Yes, because the, 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 all the, the process that we're engaged in here through the UK withdrawal bill uh, gives ministers those, those powers, but under parliamentary scrutiny. And that is precisely what we are saying here. We're simply extending 
the principle, and, and it's a very simple principle, that it is for this Parliament to decide what happens to the law in devolved areas. Ministers are subject to, their actions are subject to scrutiny and, of course, to, to control by the Parliament, but this simply regularises a position where we don't wish UK ministers to be able to do this without any supervision of any description at all, and that's what we were, we, we were facing. Uh, and the solution here is to say that they can, of course, do this, but what they do will not have legal effect. But, of course, Scottish ministers are subject to scrutiny on these powers, whereas UK ministers weren't. And so what would be the mechanism by which Scottish ministers seek the approval of Parliament uh, to give or withhold consent in these circumstances? Section 17 is at least in part a response to recommendations of this committee in its interim re report on the EU withdrawal bill at uh, paragraph 129 and following. The committee made clear that it would support the uh, proposal that the Scottish ministers and Welsh government's consent should be required for instruments made in these situations, but it emphasised the need at paragraph 131 for parliamentary scrutiny of Scottish ministers' proposals prior to consent being given to UK ministers. Um, the Scottish Government and the parliamentary authorities are currently involved in discussion about exactly how that might work under the EU withdrawal bill and it's the expectation of the Scottish Government that any uh, agreement that was reached there would be equally applicable to decisions <coughs> under the Scottish Continuity Bill for Scottish Ministers to consent to UK uh, regulations. That's very welcome reassurance, but I, I'm still wondering uh, whether the Government is open to having uh, that reassurance given some substance in the face of the bill? Uh, yes, but I think we have to see, and I think we're quite close to seeing what the outcome of the discussion is with the Parliament about what the procedure should be. But yes, I mean, I, and, and remember, this is saying to UK ministers, you can't do this, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean to say we've done it, right? We would still have to do something to have the equivalent effect, which would be subject to scrutiny. Okay. Um, I wanted to come on to the, the EU principles as well. well let, let me get the other okay. details, stuff sorted out about the bill itself. So we, <coughs> if we've got time, we'll come back to that, Patrick. Alexander. Uh, thank you, Convener. I thank the Minister for the update he provided uh, and uh, his intention to provide an update in advance of each parliamentary stage of a bill. Um, one area not updated is on the financial cost of this and of secondly legislation required. Um, I was wondering, given uh, paragraph 16 in the financial memorandum where the Scottish Government commits to sharing with the Scottish Parliament information about uh, anticipated level of legislation uh, and financial implications. Uh, I was just wondering if you could provide any further update today and what we can expect in the way of updates uh, before the final stages of the bill. Well, the costs that are being incurred here, of course, are being incurred as a result of, of the UK's decisions, not our decisions. Um, so what we have to do is to make sure that we are drawing on the resource that is available uh, the UK government has been made available to meet these additional costs. And that was, uh, I think, a £3 billion allocation in the last budget, and we are looking to see how we can allocate that. So uh, we can access that. So if uh, additional costs are incurred, and one would expect them to be incurred, then we would expect the costs of Brexit to be borne by the UK government and funding to be made available to us. Uh, the, financial resolu the financial memorandum, uh, makes it clear that there are you know, considerable areas of uncertainty in this because of the nature of lack of certainty from the UK government. Uh, but we will continue to work to, to pin that down. And as we are able to, we will provide information on that. We've, we've provided some in the financial memorandum. We'll go on doing so. I don't know if there's any other points people want to make. Do you want to make any points about financing? Um, no, I think that's that's exactly the case, um, that at the present time, um, the bill is, is a framework providing for continuity of law. Um, we actually don't yet know at this point what in-state we're going to be preparing for. Undoubtedly, um, I think some of the regulations made under the bill are, are, will have financial implications, um, and we've committed to, to provide more information on that, um, as you've indicated. But at this point, um, as we've said in the financial memorandum, it, we just simply don't know the, the scale and the potential content of the, the secondary legislation that's, that's going to be needed, um, but we continue to, to look at that. We are, of course, you know, happy to continue to keep people updated and, and those who have any influence with the UK government that can make sure that they un, untie the purse strings to make sure that some of the money that they've allocated for Brexit comes to Scotland would be very welcome. The bill does, of course, make some particular provisions which we, we feel and, and are required to make in terms of detail of, of expenditure, but that is essentially backstop provisions and those are in the bill. 
expect by the end of, <coughs> or by the final stages, to have any clearer indication of costs? Or so well, I, I think at the present moment, as the UK government has no indi clear indication of costs, and the costs that we will incur flow from their costs, uh, then only if the UK government has those would we be able to do so. And that applies to the whole UK withdrawal bill. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I'm in no different position on that than I would have been if we didn't have a continuity bill, because the UK government has not indicated that. Thank you. Neil, you're either on section 13, do you want yeah. to still go there? Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Camina. Uh, just on section 13, the power to use, uh, ministerial power to use secondary legislation to incorporate uh, new EU law. Um, I think you'll have seen the, the, asked the expert panel before their views on this, and uh, Professor Page said this power was a thoroughly bad idea, um, and also in written evidence said it would be a major surrender uh, by the Parliament. Um, that can Concerns me greatly. Does it concern you, and will you reflect on the evidence from the expert panel that we've? It concerns me if it were true. I don't believe it to be true. I mean, I, I absolutely, uh, I'm surprised by the reaction to this because uh, of two things. One is there was a widespread expectation when the EU, UK withdrawal bill was passed that these powers would be in it, for very simple and technical reasons. This is not; these are not powers being exercised out with the supervision of any parliament. Uh, these are these are absolutely under the scrutiny of the parliament. But there are technical reasons why you would want to have a continuity of law. And, and let me you know, give you a couple of them. One of them might apply to what it, what, uh, whatever solution is found north and south in Ireland. Might find that the UK, the Northern Ireland is operating, for example, uh, you know, regulatory alignment with the EU on issues of agriculture. If we are to put in place arrangements with Northern Ireland, we ourselves would have to have regulatory alignment on certain agricultural issues. All this bill does is allows us to, to say we can do that. You know, so it, essentially this was a power we thought would exist right across the UK. Uh, and it's a power that says in certain circumstances there will be technical reasons why we need to do this. You know, I, I mentioned the medicines agency. The medicines agency is another possibility here where you would want to make sure that the regulations that follow uh, as a result of signing on to the, the, the medicines agency, if you did that, continue to operate. And those would be dynamic. And if you didn't do that, uh, you know, and you were part of, and your drugs were being approved by the medicines agency, if you allowed that to, uh, to atrophy in any way, then you would not be part of the process and your drugs could not be approved. It was one of the great fallacies of the the, 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 the Leave movement, in some sense, a s dynamic UK-only medicines approval agency would produce remarkable results. It turns out, as pharmaceutical companies could have told you from day one, that wouldn't happen because the UK is only 3% of the market. You would only go for that approval at the end of getting everybody else EU and US approval. So this is a largely a technical measure. It also lapses, uh, and it lapses and will lapse unless Parliament decides for it not to lapse. And there are areas such as food standards, some areas of environmental standards, where you would be you would require to do this if, for example, you were to continue to have, let me use an example in my own constituency, if you were to continue to sell live shellfish into Europe, you would continue to have to observe some of the regulations, the food regulations, otherwise you couldn't do it. And therefore, uh, far from it being, you know, as described, I, I think it is a technical measure, it is, it is subject to parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary control, and it is sunsetted. And in all those circumstances, I think it's a thoroughly reasonable thing to do and exists in the Welsh Bill as well. Uh, so I don't think it is the, I don't recognise the description and I don't think it's the innovation that people say it is. Murdoch. Thank you, um, Convener. Um, in the evidence we've had from the Lost Society of Scotland, there is a number of concerns about the detail of the bill, and time does not permit me to, to go through them all uh, this morning. Um, but I want to raise um, the, the uh, issue of uh, Section 5, which deals with general principles of EU uh, law. Um, and um, uh, Section 5 uh, makes it clear, if I can just find it. Um, Section 5 makes it clear that the general principles of EU law and the Charter of Fundamental Rights a part of Scots law on or after exit day, subject to various um, qualifications that are contained um, in various uh, subsections. But the bill does not specify what these general principles or fundamental rights are. Are you able to tell us what the Scottish Government believes them to be? Well, is it in the notes of the policy memorandum, there are examples given of, of what these are. 
but you know, I, I think all of us have been in this position before in, in committees and in considering legislation, which the more specific you are about each of them and laying them out, you know, the more likely you are to leave something out or something to include it. They are understood to be the case. Uh, perhaps Luke sh should make the, the, the case here. However, and it relates to the question that Patrick Harvey asked about environmental principles, you know, I think it is possible to continue to give more examples if that would be helpful, you know, but I think it's impossible to define them absolutely and every single one of them in, 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 in the legislation because I think that would be dangerous to do. But look. The Charter of Fundamental Rights is an instrument and it is incorporated and I don't think there will be any difficulty um, working out which aspects of that continue to apply given the, the, the tests in Section 5. On the general principles, we've taken the same approach as the EU Withdrawal Bill, which is that our reference simply to the general principles is sufficient and that when there's a, a question arises about what is meant or whether a particular general principle applies, that will continue to be, as it is at the moment, a question for the courts to resolve. The explanatory notes at paragraphs 30 to 32 give more detail about what the Scottish Government understands these general principles to be and how that would, the incorporation of them under Section 5 would work. As the Minister has indicated, we're, we're content to consider whether we can expla uh, expand on that explanatory material over the next two weeks. Thank you. Anything else, Anna Um you said that you, you're going to give more consideration to whether that needs to be expanded over the, the next two weeks. Um, do you mean uh, for that to be expanded in some policy statement or uh, by amendments to the legislation, amendments to the continuity bill? No, uh, we're taking the same approach as the UK bill on this because of the difficulty of defining everything. I think the point I'm making is that the explanatory notes contain <coughs> items and it may be useful to contain other items. For example, I listened to the exchange you had about environmental principles. I'm very sympathetic to that. I would like to, to name those principles in the explanatory notes so that there's no doubt that we believe them to be included in there. Right? So that's what I think would be useful to do. But I think if you go to a, a situation where you're naming, trying to name every single thing, I think you will run into some very considerable problems. I mean, there has been significant debate at Westminster about the, the EU withdrawal bill and to what extent uh, arguments around, for example, uh, environmental principles like precaution, polluted pays principle, but also around animal welfare and animal sentience ought to be included either in that legislation or elsewhere. Um, to what extent do you feel that that argument is relevant to the continuity bill and needs to be addressed? I think it needs to be addressed, but I don't think it can be addressed by, an ex by, a, a, by a very long list to which it is added to in the face of the bill. I think it can be addressed and should be addressed by indicating what we believe those, uh, it, illustrating those principles. And you know, some of those things need to be included in here. I'm happy to have that debate. Uh, and, and finally, the, the other question that I put to the previous panel uh, was about Section 5.3, which... Um, says that this whole, this whole section uh, applies uh, in relation to uh, a general principle only if it was recognised as a general principle uh, of EU law by the European Court in a case decided before exit day. Uh, is it enough to say that it has to be a, a principle that was recognised in a case decided, or are there general principles... Uh, is it is it the, the case that there, there may be general principles which are recognised but don't refer to a, uh, aren't referred to in a specific case? I heard the panel's response to that too, and I, I have to say I agree with the panel on that. I, mean, I don't think it is possible to have general principles which are you know not established as such uh, in cases decided or you know, have not yet been recognised as such. I, I think this is a necessary definition that you have to apply. Okay, thank you. I don't. I'm baffled by this set of answers, Minister, um, uh, including the last one that you just gave to Patrick Harvey's question, how, that, how your answer to Patrick Harvey's question is compatible with Section 13 of the Bill, I don't know. But on the point of general principles, is it the Scottish Government's view that subsidiarity is a general principle of EU law? Yes. Is it the Scottish Government's view that that principle of subsidiarity applies only to the relationship between member states and the EU, or is it a general principle of subsidiarity? That applies also, for example, the relationship between Scottish government, UK government, local authorities, Scottish government. I think, 
mean, this is the yeah. sort of clarification yeah. that I think we're going yeah. to need if Section 5 is going to have any meaningful effect if it's enacted at all. Well, that may be an example of why it would not be a good idea to try and choose which general principles are frozen. I mean, what we're trying to do is take across all of the general principles that are currently recognised by the Court of Justice. That's the kind of definition of general principles. They have to be things that have been recognised by the Court of Justice. Now, there will be room for argument about how those general principles will apply in a new context in which we are not a member state. And I don't think it would be right to prejudge that in relation to the set of general principles that we want to bring across into domestic law on leaving the EU. Would it, would, would, would Can I bring Luke in? I, I think it's important just to be clear what the distinction between the approach of this bill to the general principles and the approach of the EU withdrawal bill to the general principles is. The EU withdrawal bill would incorporate the general principles with the same tests as they have been recognised by the Court of Justice on and after exit day, but it would exclude them as the basis of a right for action. The difference in this bill is that we do not exclude, we provide for a, a greater continuity of law in that where there is an existing right of action that continues to be available after withdrawal. The other qualification that is in the continuity bill, which I think is uh, irrelevant to Press Tompkins' question, is that the general principles are incorporated under the continuity bill only to the extent that they relate to anything to which sections 2, 3 or 4 applies. So it is to the devolved retained EU law incorporated under the continuity bill that the general principles are uh, retained as part of Scots law after exit day. <laughs> all of which is just an invitation to litigation, isn't it? I mean, all, all, all of, I mean, the, especially the critical difference between the way in which the withdrawal bill deals with the general principles and the way in which Section Six of this bill deals, Section Five of this bill deals with the general principles. The Scottish government seeking to retain this right of action is a positive encouragement to litigate and litigate and litigate again in the Scots courts on, for example, the applicability of the um, old doctrine of subsidiarity to the relationship between local authorities and the Scottish government because of the way in which Section Five has been drafted, but not defined. It's, it's no invitation to litigate in a situation where litigation wouldn't already be possible. I, I think you know, that is very firmly our view, that it is a, a necessary and important right to give, but it is not in any sense, and I repeat this publicly, not in any sense an invitation to litigate by any... Good luck with that. <laughs> right, OK, listen, uh, can I just say, first of all, this has been a very complex and you know, difficult area to deal with. I very much appreciate the tone of respect that the committee and the government have carried out this process this morning. I think it's actually been the committee working at its best. Uh, can I thank our advisor, Christine O'Neill, and the witnesses we had earlier for giving us their advice in such short notice. Um, and we will move on to stage two next week as a committee. And therefore, oh, I hope... Stage one is passed. Uh, provided stage one is passed. Absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> and I've already been warned by the deputy convener to bring my sleeping bag for next week <laughs> for stage two. So with that, I close this meeting of the Thank Finance Committee.